I just can't be behind the camera. It was so bad. Yeah, I feel. I feel like I'm waiting. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't I can't I I I need soup because I'm going to die. Oh, do I have to pass that? You can't have for anything being a hug. Hi, everybody. I hope, I hope everybody enjoyed the last class. Um, it was kind of like a learning experience for me as well. One thing I'm going to tell you, last first class you got the lawyer attire, that's over with. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I, I'm encouraging you as we go along to ask questions, to, to kind of keep this as interactive as possible, because you'll learn better that way. And I don't want the situation to One of the things I, I don't want to do, since I'm used to primarily teaching continuing legal education at the lawyer level, I don't want to throw jargon at you. Um, and if, so if I use words that don't make sense or you don't know what it means, take a second. I don't care. I don't mind the interruption. I'd rather the explanation be clear and you know what we're talking about. So I just want to go over a couple of things that we started on last time and then I'm going to take you down the rabbit hole into uh, paying for the real estate and I'm going to bore you to death with loan documents but you're going to learn what they do and why and so on, and they're horrible. <laughs> I warned you last week they were boring. So we talked about legal descriptions a little bit last week, and I used as examples, um, oh, we're in a different group, so I can't say seat one, row three as easily, but it's the same concept. When you're dealing with lots and blocks, they're very easy to describe because a map has been recorded in the public records, and that's, you refer to the legal description by referring to the map. However, I also talked about the situation where you start in the corner of the room and go 50 feet this way, 100 feet that way, 50 feet this way, 100 feet that way, back to the point of the beginning. And where it gets even more confusing is when that description starts at the elevator. And you have to work literally, I mean, so this is, I mean, I'm using the building as a graphic example because you walk through it, but I can show you, I'm not going to show you, I could show you examples particularly out in Weston, where they, when they built the Park of Commerce, where they started basically at the intersection of Royal Palm and Weston Road, in the center there, and from there you had to go calls and distances until you got to the entrance, to the beginning of a park division, and then inside the park division to each individual building, and the descriptions are just ridiculous, because they just, they, when you don't record the specific map, you have more flex the developer has more flexibility, it still becomes a nightmare in terms of the description because the more you have to write or type in a legal description, the more possibility there is for error. Now, what I put up there is not really legible. I understand that, especially the further back you are. Maybe I'll back it out a little bit. But if you look at this description, which says clearly about description, this is what I'm going to show you here is an actual ancient plat. Um, that may be handwritten. Font. Okay, just font. I love that. If you can see down here, this is 1961. I believe that's a six. Okay. Font. No. So, and what happened was the surveyors. Now I'm going to back this out and show you that this. So when you when you create this map in the public records. What you have to do is you first have to describe the perimeter. I've already had somebody figure out where this was, so give me a second while I try and clarify this just a little bit. Okay. So what you're looking at is a plat. Uh, it's got a name on there. It's actually a re-subdivision. This is an example I grabbed out of a file. It's a re-subdivision of another uh, subdivision. So what happens is, you have a big area, and someone says, well, I don't like the way those lines and lots and such, they're not practical for selling, so I'm going to take that, I'm going to chop it up again and make it even smaller blocks. So this resubdivision, you see all these squares around here, are actual lots and blocks that are created to be designated 
So the next time it got conveyed, instead of saying, drawing the lines and that ridiculous legal description, you just refer, my pointer work if I go like that? Yeah. Okay, so there's lot one, and it goes up one, two, three, four to the north, and then there's a big parcel C that's what was the original area. So this is what an old subdivision plat looks like. They're all over the place, probably wherever uh, you see buildings in today's world, most places are platted like this. The platting process I'll talk about when we get into the land use stuff, but I wanted to show you this dealing with the legal description. The other thing I wanted to show you, I don't remember who guessed where that plat was. Actually, I don't think she's back at the room yet. Um, this, this is the survey. Sorry, this is, I have to get used to the fact that this is on an angle, probably for my benefit. Can we see this whole area here? Okay. It may actually be easier for me to come and see what I'm looking at here. Okay, so this is a survey. And I told you that the standard of a legal description was whether or not a survey could read, a surveyor could determine where the land was. But on the other side of legal descriptions, the survey, the purpose of the survey is to make sure that the improvements that are constructed on the land are on the land and that they're not on somebody else's land. So what you're seeing here, although it's a little fuzzy, and I apologize for that, I'll try and zoom that in just a little bit. I want it to be at least some legibility. By the way, I tried to send things by email so you have some documents. I'm going to get that perfected. Um, there, there's a group email that doesn't work. At least it didn't work for me. I don't know if I get some tech support and get, figure out how to get something to you guys. But anyway, so that's an, actually an office building. Um, it's located at the corner, somebody already caught this, but to the corner of Federal Highway and US 1. And it basically depicts. Federal Highway and US 1? Yes. Oh, City Bank Park. Oh, US oh sorry. Park. Sorry, thank you. The City Bank 1? Oh, yes, City, City Bank 1? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, originally it was known as the Ken Ann Building because the people that owned it and built it originally were Ken and Ann. Huh. <laughs> True. Um, so you'll see it depicts the building, uh, parking spaces, which if this was a little clearer, you'd see that they're actually, on some surveys, they're act you can see every single parking space enumerated. Um, you see the borders, you see setbacks, you see where there's easements. Um, and we'll get into those other things when I start getting into more descriptions and title later. But because we talked about legal descriptions as part of the contract review, I wanted you to see what the survey looked like. Yes, sir? Who's the curator of the documents? Curator? Yeah, he is. It's the municipality, the state. Of what document? That's private. Okay. Plat is recorded in the public records. The survey is the most of the property owner. Okay. Sorry. Missed that one. Okay, so. We're going to leave legal descriptions and such. And I want to talk about a few things relating to paying for the property. Okay, so we're going to move down. If you remember from the contract, once we described the property, the next thing was paying for it. And that's our concentration today. As simple as that sounds, it gets kind of complicated. What do you think is the easiest way to pay for something? Well, thank you. What do you, what do you think is the easiest way to pay for something? Benjamin. Good. Okay, good. I mean, I know uh, other people don't necessarily use cash anymore. At least I see cards go by and Venmo and other things that I don't quite use. But cash is very simple. The problem is, that's great when you're going to Publix and you're going to spend $7 for a sandwich and a glass of water, or a bottle of water. It doesn't work so well when you're spending 100000 or 500000 or a million dollars for a piece of property. For a practical reason, it's very heavy. Uh, I don't think you can carry a million dollars, even in large bills. But more importantly, there's reporting requirements. Uh, people don't realize that, first of all, if you're depositing more than $10,000 in the bank, you have to fill out all kinds of internal revenue service forms talking about the source of the money. And um, it's just, it doesn't work. It could be you, you, there's security issues. There are um, bulk issues. There's questions as to whether the cash is legitimate or not. Uh, and I'm, interestingly enough, I talked about some of the, one of the things I'm going to talk about when we get into leasing is something that I've been doing a lot of that might pique your interest in leasing with cannabis businesses. Um, and that's a real problem with money. We'll get into that later on. So 
if you're going to pay for the property and you don't want to just bring bags of cash, I've had that happen by the way, I've actually had closings, uh, I think it was a, 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 a gardener, who was a lawn maintenance guy, and showed up with crumpled brown paper bags, literally filled with tens and twenties for whatever his cash was, he was buying something, he had to come up with $20,000 and he just dumped it. Yep. It happens. It's, it says right on it, legal tender. So, you know, it, but it, it does require forms. Did you have Don't a take it. When that happened? <laughs> That's illegal. That's a that happens to be illegal. You, there, was, there was a federal regulation against photocopying currency. Really? I know people, people that are handling closings, title companies, uh, real estate agents, think that to protect yourself, you photocopy the money. If you look it up, it's technically illegal. Yeah, the, photo, the title company that I was dealing with, that's what they would do. They would photocopy. Because they want a record of it. I mean, everyone wants their file to be complete. But, and, you know, I think, I do believe there is, because it's, you know, there's counterfeiting, especially today's copiers and printers, mm -hmm. you can print a color copy of something, yeah. and you don't know. I mean, you look at cash. We were walking down the street a couple of weeks ago, walking to get her to a restaurant, and I looked down, and there was, and my wife ran before I could. No. And she grabbed it. She said, Oh my God, is this real? I said, Let me look at it. And I took it from her, and she said, If it's real, it's mine. If it's not, it's yours. No. So I started studying it, and it, you know, it had. Like a, a new hundred dollar bill, it had a big picture of Franklin, it had the orange seal, it had all kinds of things. And the more I studied, all of a sudden I noticed it had a legend on the front in small print and then big across the back for motion picture use only. Mm -hmm. And it was movie money because they don't use real currency. Uh, actually, I have a client that makes license plates for films. Nice. So that you know, when you see a license plate, you oh, you don't want to trace down somebody's car. So they they created it. So it was not real money. Mm -hmm. it's very interesting though. Okay. okay, so cash is a problem. Um, how else might you pay for something where there's no mortgage? Any ideas? Bank transfer. What's that? Bank transfer. Wire. Bank transfer. Another word wire. for that is a wire transfer. Good. So wire transfers are. The definition of a wire transfer is an instantaneous transfer of funds that takes all day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't write that down. No. And I say that I because all of your flowers. I, I say that because we deal with them all the time. I mean, I'm doing closings with large, large amounts of money, and really the preferred way to move money back and forth is a wire right. transfer. Mm -hmm. The problem is that <clears throat> you fill out a form or you do something, you give it to your accounting department. Your accounting department has to call it into the bank or go mm -hmm. online and do something to, with the bank. Then it has to go to a second person in most mm -hmm. law firms and, and places dealing with these transfers, a, a, a confirming person so that the first person isn't stealing it. Then the bank puts it in the wire room and it gets processed in the wire room at, at the sending bank and the person at the wire room could possibly be a lunch. Things, things that, believe it or not, things like that actually happen. Um, there was one bank that would hold their wires until the very end of the day because they were trying to make the float on the money. And it was always mm -hmm. annoying because you would never get a confirmation until about five or three, which is an issue. Behind the time, that's a right. my next question. So, so then it goes to the receiving bank. Then the receiving bank's wire room processes it. And then they call their customer, who is the, the seller or bank or whoever's getting the money, and they finally confirm the receipt of the money, and it's done. And sometimes that process can really take hours, which is very frustrating, but it is still the best way to move the money. The problem with wire transfers is wire fraud. Mm. So what happens is you get a situation where we prepare for the closing. I'm representing a seller, or I'm representing a buyer. The seller signs a piece of paper and says, these are my wire instructions. Now, to wire money, you need size the name and address of the, the person, usually the name and address of the sending and receiving bank, an interbank address called an ABA number. Mm -hmm. That's a domestic ABA number. It's the bank's... Bank code. Uh, yes, but there's different codes. It's, there, it's in the federal banking system. That's how they move wire. It's routing number. Yeah. That's the word I'm, the word I'm looking for. 
If you're doing internationally, there's another code called the SWIFT code, but it's not particularly important. So that happens if you're cautious, you get a signed piece of paper from the person receiving the money and you have the information. Then what happens is the day of the closing, the day before the closing, you get an email. Hi, I'm the seller. Uh, I sent you my wire instructions. My CPA has told me that I need to put the money into a different account for tax reasons. Please use this information. Guess what? They've been hacked. This happens, actually happens. If you are not careful about this, then you, have, you, are, you use the new information, which is the wrong information, and instead of the money going where it belongs, the money goes to the hacker. Oh, so they hacked them beforehand oh, yeah. and knew that this 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 transaction was occurring. And you can't oh, get the money back. Wow. They start, it actually happened a lot uh, mm -hmm. where I, I work out of Brevard County and all the agents in that area were getting targeted. And last year, I would probably say every other transaction I was doing, I would receive an email like that. So I made a policy that I don't send wire transfer from a title company. I have the buyer call the title company directly, obtain it, then send their money. Okay, so there we go. Still, it's, still it's in the target, jumping the gun, but good. That, that's the team. There's, there's the same thing. What happens, what happens now is we are being cautioned by our underwriters and, and the bar and all to do a telephone confirmation with the actual customer mm -hmm. and confirm the wire instructions. What I use representing a seller particularly is actually a notarized statement that's got the bank information on it. Uh, they sign it, it's notarized just like the deed and everything else, and that's in my file, and I don't vary that uh, for any reason. Mm. Some people don't want a wire. I don't know why, but it does happen every once in a while. You get somebody, it's usually the, the crusty farmer selling the old land, and I don't trust these banks and stuff like that, and they want a check. Okay? Yeah. That's, one, that's an outbound check. Inbound, we get checks when we're at the beginning, you remember on the contract, the first section of that contract dealing in money was the deposit. The deposit is the consideration for the contract, that's important. Almost always, well not always, some of you, 50% of the time, you're going to get a check for that. Check is given to the real estate agent, and this also, by the way, varies if you're dealing in house closings or commercial closings. So they'll hand you a check. And then they're going to say, I want an escrow letter. The escrow letter is given by the title company or the law firm that's holding the money that says to the parties of the transaction, we have the money, so that everybody knows that the buyers put the deposit up. The problem is, what happens if the check bounces? And you've now given that escrow letter. You know, sometimes checks are no good. It's not enough money. There's all kinds of reasons why a check could be no good. So, if it's a regular personal check, we always use a phrase, subject to collection. Because just like I went through the, the litany, of, well, it's a much more compressed time, the litany of the wire going from one bank to the other bank, a check is issued by the person whose account it is. It is then given to the recipient. The recipient puts it in their bank. That's the paying, the payee bank. The payee bank then puts the check through the Federal Reserve System and it goes to the, the bank on which the money is drawn, and then it's paid into a bank. Now, that process used to take three to five business days back before the, this thing. Um, now, you know, you pull out your iPhone or whatever phone and you take a picture of the check and bleep, the check's in your account, and that, that image is floating through the system. It's literally clear the next day the way it works. So that reduces some of the risk, but it doesn't mean that the person writing the check can't change their mind and stop payment uh, or do things like that. So in issuing the escrow letter, you have to be careful not to take the risk on yourself and to use magic words saying, we've received this check subject to collection. It used to be subject to clearance, which is also used, the correct words are subject to collection. In dealing with more urgent money, and I don't mean the deposit, I mean like if someone wants to bring a check to a closing to close on the property, then we have a couple of different uh, alternatives if they don't want to do the wire. Some, some uh, closing agents will take this and some closing agents won't. First thing is a cashier's check. Everybody seen a cashier's check? You go to the bank, 
you pay a little fee sometimes. They reach in the drawer and they pull out this fancy multicolored with seals and gold stuff and all kinds of things. They put it through a machine and they take it back to the person in the back room and they stamp it and seal it and sign it. It's really official. And if it's a cashier's check, it means that it is an obligation of the bank. The bank has now issued a check. There's something that's not quite a cashier's check that you will see uh, more likely, unless you ask specifically, and it's called an official check. Looks cool. It's got all the nice words on it, and it appears to be uh, what it is, but it's not. Because what happens is that is a check on the bank's checking account with another bank, which is a little peculiar. A cashier's check necessarily has to be drawn on the issuing institution. Mm -hmm. So if you walk into Wells Fargo and you want a cashier's check, that's going to be a Wells Fargo check payable by and through Wells Fargo. If you go in to, I don't know, uh, XYZ and they give you an official check, that official check might be issued by XYZ Bank and have its name across the top, but if you look at the tiny fine print, it'll say payable at Bank of America because that's their, their bank account is at another bank. And that's, it's okay, but it's not quite as good. That was an official check? That's an official check. And people, surprisingly enough, people don't really pay attention to the difference unless you're, you're really watching as to what it is. The other kind of check is a certified check. Mm -hmm. Certified checks you do not see in Florida. Uh, very, very, very rarely. If anybody comes from up north or another state, you might have, been, you might have seen a certified check where it's stamped, and they literally, in some places, they will punch holes through it, through the, some of the numbers at the bottom of the check. And what that is, when, you, when the bank certifies, you take your personal little check, you go to the bank, and they certify it by withdrawing the money from your account at the time they certify it. So there's no question that check is good because they've taken the money out, and they're holding it to use to pay that check when it's presented for payment. The reason it's not used in Florida is because in Florida, a certified check is considered to be a promise to pay. A promise to pay is subject to documentary stamp tax. And we're, going to, we're going to talk about those when we get to the, the, the loan documents in a minute. Documentary stamp tax is figured at the basis of 35 cents per hundred dollars of consideration. If anybody's ever closed on a, a loan, you'll see there's all these charges, and the big charges that are in the recording section of the closing statement. There's Doc stamps, which is a tax imposed by the state of Florida on the promise to pay. There's also, I think we talked about last week, transfer taxes on deed. That's also a doc stamp, but it's a different kind of tax computed at a different rate. So you see, you don't see them because they're taxable. So you have to, you have to pay. You would have to pay a tax in addition to whatever other fees there are. And why do that when you can get a cashier's check or a wire? So nobody uses them here. You will occasionally see them come from other states. You pay for the wire, too. No, it's, it's not a Florida obligation. The, pro the promise to pay doesn't occur in Florida, therefore it's not subject to Florida tax. But you do pay for the wire, though. Depends on your relationship. If you're an individual... Oh, some people get it. If you're an individual um, and, you know, you, you just walk into your bank and say, I need to wire money, yes, they'll usually charge you a service fee because they can. Yeah. If you're a business that has a lot of money in the bank, and a very strong relationship, oh. and you're doing a lot of that kind of business, part of your negotiation with the relationship is that they're not going to charge you per wire. Okay. Or they charge you and you know, it never flows through the clients and you never know about it. Okay. Um, almost all the time, though, you will see on you smaller closing started. agents, whether they're smaller law firms or smaller title companies, you will see a charge for the wire on the closing yeah, statement because they're yeah. passing the cost to it. Yes. Um, similar to a wire, I guess, like, kind of what you were saying, now that there are other payment options, such as, I know a lot of banks use, like, Zelle Quick Pay or whether it's, like, PayPal Direct, it's not quite a bank transfer. Like, is that still legitimate? No. There are limits. There are okay. limits. So that's not more like yeah. a check. Yeah. That's more like your personal check. Gotcha. There are limits. Really, well, it is is a paperless check. Um, you know, it's got to go through the same processing because even though they're administered by banks, that's not the bank issuing the money. The wire is actually the bank taking the money out of your account and pushing it through the Federal Reserve System to the other account. The, the PayPal's, the, those are all third-party pay systems. Okay? Any other questions on how to pay without getting mortgage? Okay. 
Where do I begin with a mortgage? Let's start by talking about the basics of what a note and mortgage are. I guess that's the easiest place to start. So a promissory note is where you start. A promissory note, when you borrow money, this is kind of basic. A promissory note when you borrow money is a document that says, I promise to pay. Kind of simple, right? Well, that's the first sentence of the whole thing, and that is the easiest part of the whole thing. Um, but if I have my things in proper order, which I do, I'm going to show you what a promissory note looks like and go over all the complications that are in a promissory note and why. Now, I apologize for the complexity of some of these. I decided the best way to do this was with complex documents. I know I am going to make an effort, like I said, to send these to you so that you can have them to look at. Um, I know the last time I was able to get you the contract as we talked about it, this was just, there was too much to copy. I couldn't do it. Uh, I, this should be straighter. Can you see everything side to side? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so, now obviously it's been redacted and you can see it's for a substantial amount of money, or at least in most worlds it is. We deal with mortgages and notes uh, very large. This was actually, uh, I can't, obviously I can't, uh, I can't tell you who the client was or the property. That's why you see all the black stuff in there because um, you gotta be very careful about that kind of stuff. I'm not 100% sure which one this was, but this is a 14 million, almost 15 million dollar construction loan for the construction of, I believe it was a hotel. So, I'll, I'll, it's, it's either a hotel or a condo, and I, I, I'm really sorry. No, no, it's a condo. Never mind. It's a condo. I just saw what county it was in. <laughs> Bear with me one second because I want to get my examples right. Because if it's the condo, then it's, it's actually very interesting because it's a, um, well, okay, we'll figure it out. I'll figure out which one is. It doesn't matter. It starts off right at the beginning. This is the point at the very beginning, the very first couple of lines, where it says, for value received, which is a recitation of consideration. You'll see that all over the place in legal documents. Sometimes it says for $10 or other good or value consideration. It's, it's, a, it's a little archaic because as a practical matter, the borrower is getting the money. The, so there's a, there's a, there is actual legal consideration for the promise. The recitation has been left forever. So there's things that go on. If you look at a deed, which we will do uh, later on when we get into title and conveyancing documents, the deed has usually $10 and other good or value consideration. Now, obviously it's not $10, but you don't type in the full amount of the consideration, at least on Florida deeds. Other states do use that and require it because that way the recording office knows the amount that was paid for the property and they know how much to uh, impose the transfer tax on. But, you know, when you get to, to these kinds of documents, obviously these are complex and there's lots of customization, but with a standard document like a conveyance indeed, the fewer things you have to write in there and type in there, the fewer opportunities for mistakes. So you don't put the full consideration in there. So it's, it's now you'll see it's paid to the order of, but on the second line, it's redacted of course, it's successors and assigns here and after the bank. And the reason for that is that banks transfer these promissory notes. Um, they, they make some smaller banks will originate a loan, they'll cause the loan to be created, they'll loan the money, and they'll turn around and they'll sell it to a bigger institution so they get their money back so they can go through the process. That's called an origination. That's where the, the one bank originates the loan, they go through the process, and we'll talk more about the actual process to approve a loan, but they create the loan, and then they sell it, and they get the money back, the money gets recycled, and they go make another one. Meanwhile, whoever holds the note after it's been sold is the one that actually collects the payment. That doesn't usually happen with a construction loan. This, is, this happens to be a construction note. And in construction, the process includes 
the originating bank supervising the construction, construction of the building. But you'll see, if you come down a few lines in that first paragraph, you'll see the dollar amount is repeated again, because lawyers like to repeat things two and three times. And then it says, or so much thereof as may be advanced by the bank. Why do you think that would be? Well, you'll, when you're dealing with a construction loan, they want to make sure that there's collateral, there's security for the repayment of the loan. And when you start a construction loan, there's usually a piece of raw land, and that piece of raw land is probably not worth $14 million. So as the borrower, the developer, starts to build the project, they are putting more value into the property by adding concrete, steel, nails, and wires, and glass. And so as the bank sees the value of the property is being increased, they make advances. And we'll, you'll see the document that does that a little bit later. But I wanted to start with the note first, because I always say to people that the promissory note is the most important loan document because it has the magic words at the top, I promise to pay, and it usually has a signature at the bottom. What Question? does it mean, non-revolving note, promissory note? The last line of the first paragraph. Okay, good what? question. Well, sophisticated, but a good question. So a revolving promissory note is a, a promissory note where you can borrow the money from the bank, not for this kind of a loan typically. Borrow money from the bank, you have it in your business, you have it, usually it's in a business. And business is really good. So you, you, you have a lot of money in your bank account, you don't need the bank's money that you're paying interest on. So you pay the money back to the bank. You give it back to the bank and the interest stops on the money you give back to them. You're only paying interest on what you're hanging on to. But two months from now, it's your slow season. People are going on vacation and they're not, now you need the money again. So now you borrow the money again. With a revolving note, you have one set of closing costs at the very beginning, but the money can go in and out and in and out. It's, it's a, a type of loan facility. It's similar to a line of credit, except, yes, an equity line of credit is typically um, a revolving loan, yes, that's correct. But in a less sophisticated way. There's no start and end date to a revolving line of credit? Not true. Is good, that, was that good, the distinction? Good question, no. Um, because what happens is, even with credit business credit lines, mm -hmm. banks want to see, an, in some cases, an annual cleanup. They will, there are a lot of situations of revolving lines where to make sure that the business is healthy, the bank will say, once a year, you have to get your balance down to zero, and then you can borrow it out again. Mm -hmm. uh, not all the time. Not every single loan has that feature, but some, you know, on a typical revolving business loan, you will find that. Good. See, this is why the questions are so important, because it takes us off into top, extra topics, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, so now, let's go to the next section. The next section, let me see the next section. Sorry, this is this is a little peculiar. Somebody help make sure that I, you can see end to end on the paragraph. Okay. So here you see now during the it, it starts talking about how it's repaid and how the the things are the interest is computed. And I don't want to go stepping into the finance class too much, but for purposes of the construction loan, you'll see that during the initial 18-month term of the note. Which now they have, remember I talked about definitions of the contract? Here it is in parentheses, quotes, and bold. The construction slash stabilization period, which they, and they can renew it. Um, we'll talk, renewals, it's a little more detailed on the renewals you'll see as defined below. But So for 18 months, they're going to give you one set of terms, and then things are going to probably change. So during this stabilization period, the borrower is only going to pay interest, interest only, which means they're going to pay, everybody knows what interest is, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to get that basic. You're just going to pay monthly payments of interest based upon what's been dispersed, only what's been dispersed. So in that first couple of months, if only a few hundred thousand dollars of the loan has been dispersed, interest is only going to accrue and be charged on that amount. For this period, while they're building the building and while they're filling the building with occupants or it could be tenants, it could be selling condo units, it could be hotel rooms, whatever it is. The bank gives you a stabilization period in addition to the construction period to get the business to ramp up where it's cash flowing, where it can make the payments. At that point, they're going to start paying 
principal and interest to start repaying. But that'll be the next paragraph. So then it talks about how the interest is computed, and there you have, this is a little bit of a complex um, calculation. I believe that from what I've seen on, the, on, on Dr. Forby's syllabus, and I don't know how many of you are taking his class as well, but you're talking about adjustable rate mortgages and fixed rate mortgages and things like that. Those kinds of adjustable rate mortgages, especially in the residential arena, adjust either annually or uh, every five years. In a commercial loan like this, it can be daily. It can be daily, it can be monthly. And here it's based on a much more volatile index, which is the prime rate. The prime rate is the, that's probably defined. The prime rate, let's find here written. Well, they're talking about the prime rate as, the, as published in the Wall Street Journal. The prime rate is what the bank will charge to its finest customers with the best credit and the lowest risk. Um, it's a benchmark, and here they're charging 1.75% above the prime rate, which is 175 basis points if you want to speak fancy finance. Uh, so that's what the spread is over the prime rate. As the prime rate adjusts, that spread gets added to the adjusted rate. You see here once in all the news of the Federal Reserve has raised the interest rate. What the Federal Reserve is raising is the, the rate that the bank can borrow money from the Fed, which of course translates to an increase in the prime rate. If the prime rate is probably around quarter right now. So that, that's how the interest is computed. Uh, interest only during the stabilization period. The next section, there's the election to convert. See that? That's when the, that's when the bar makes a decision um, that, okay, we are now going, we're, we're stable, we can make our payments, we're changing to a fixed rate of interest, and we're going to make our payments of principal and interest. However, it's only fixed for a period of time. And then it talks about five-year changes. I'm not even going to get into swaps. Um, that, that's just a way to, to stabilize interest. It's a contract to keep the interest rate at a certain level. It's way beyond our scope here. So this talks about all the different things, how, how it's paid, how it's computed. It goes to amortization. Sometimes a borrower will make a business decision to go to the to end the stabilization period a little prematurely because they they believe they can make the payments, but the interest rates are rising and they want to lock them in. So that happens as well. And then the last paragraph talks about how it's paid. So they're going to make you're going to make equal payments of principal and interest based upon a 25 year amortization, which means that there's a schedule and in Okay, it's more of a finance question, but it's basically if you stayed on that schedule for 25 full years, you pay the loan down to zero. Except that there's a maturity date in here somewhere, which I, and on the maturity date on, on loans like this, which may be way sooner than the amortization, you have to pay the rest of the loan off. That's called a balloon payment. So the balloon payment is whatever the principal is. Uh, you, don't pay, you don't continue to pay interest. You only pay interest up to that time on a monthly basis. But the balloon payment is the rest of the principal that's outstanding paid before it's amortized down to zero. So. Yes? The way this is structured, again, apologies if I've missed it, but does this have the takeout loan baked into it, or is the balloon what then gets the takeout? You're, you're way out of this scope. I appreciate that, but that's nothing to do with this. Takeout loan, that's a whole different concept of takeout loans. It looks like what has nothing to do with it? Most of the time, this is a construction loan. Right, right, right. But does this continue past the duration of the construction period? To a point of maturity. Not, it's not permanent. OK, this is I'm not sorry. Okay, so let me, let, let me, let me try and explain that question. So, like I said, it's a little beyond the scope we're talking about. So, a takeout loan is a loan that is prearranged by the developer when the property is stabilized to replace the construction loan. The construction loan is there to build the building and then for a period of time to get the building leased up. The, the so-called takeout loan is an exit strategy for the construction lender. It's also an exit strategy for the bar. It can sometimes be the same bank, but typically, and it depends on the, the nature of the improvement, if it's a condominium, no, you're not going to see a takeout loan. Because in a condominium, 
Each individual unit is going to be bought by a buyer, and they're going to do their own financing for the individual unit. On a rental apartment building, it, typically the construction lender is not going to be the same as the permanent lender, because the permanent lender is an entity that wants to have their money working for a long period of time, like an insurance company, um, certain types of banks, Wall Street mutual funds, things like that, and they're going to give you a long-term fixed rate, permanent financing, and restrictions on prepayment. So, so then in this, is the, the variable rate is during the construction period, and then the part that where it changes over to a, a fixed rate is whenever you're going through the leasing period. Now, when, the, when they decide that it's stable, it's, a, it's called a mini perm. You can keep, I think, maybe, I think it's five years in this one. Five years, maturity day is five years after the change. Okay. Okay. change. Got it. Okay? So I think that's a little beyond the scope of the, of the document review, but it's okay. I don't mind going off on, on getting into that. I just don't want to, oh, I, I don't, I don't want to gloss you up. I don't want to gloss you guys, okay? If I'm, if I'm getting too deep into an area, please somebody speak up. Okay, so now, how are we doing on the, okay. The top, the top sentence just says that the bank is putting the floor on it. They, you know, interest rates adjust up and down, um, but they don't want it to go down too far. You know, prime rate got way down like a quarter of a percent. Well, banks don't like that. So they're going to say, you know, regardless of what the prime rate does, we're going to charge you no less than three and a half or whatever the number was at the time. So how, does there's, it, how does that affect them if they're, if it's all uh, adjusted off of the money they borrow from the Federal Reserve? So if more they profit. Get, they get yeah, they get more profit. That's the answer. I mean, they, they make a decision that if they're going to loan the developer X number of dollars, they want at least this much interest rate. They don't care what's going on with the Fed because... Actually, they would prefer it to go lower because then they, the margin between what they paid for the money and what they can lease it or give it at is great. Bigger. Yeah. Profit. Yeah. That's profit. It's called a spread. Yeah, the, spread. Difference, the difference between the cost of funds and what you would earn on your funds, and this applies to banks, it applies to us. It's called a spread. It's uh, it's profit. If you buy if you buy a, a pallet full of widgets for five dollars a widget, and you sell your widgets for seven dollars a widget, you're making two dollars. That's your profit. Perfect. Is that always? Is there always a floor? Is there always one? Pretty much. Yeah, some yeah. some like twenty five percent. I mean, like <laughs> some indexes say up but never down. Yeah. Like that's usually bad. Then the, ne the next paragraph talks about how it's calculated. Um, 360 day a year. Now, okay, so the third paragraph talks about prepayment. There's two different sections on prepayment. The first section on prepayment talks about, okay, pre let, me, let me talk about prepayment generally and not stick right to the document because I don't want to get bogged down in it. You have a promissory note, you borrow the money, you want to use the money for something. If you're making a lot of money, or you have made money, or you've finished your use of it, you want to give the money back to the bank so you don't have to continue to pay interest on it. That's called a prepayment. If you have a, a floating rate loan, most of the time it's freely prepayable, it's not a problem. If you have a fixed rate loan, now the bank has made a decision that they're willing to lock that interest rate in for your benefit for five years, let's say. So during that five-year period, they've done something to go and get the money to loan to you, and they're anticipating earning that interest rate for five years. If the interest rates come down, they don't want that money back from you because they're going to lose because they're going to have to reload it at a lower rate. If the interest rates go up, they are happy to take the money back because they can loan it out and make more. So, the typical prepayment penalty, there's a couple of different ways to compute a prepayment penalty for the bank to prohibit you from prepaying. And by the way, you never have to pay prepayment penalty unless you pay it. And I'm going to take you off on just another little sidebar with that, and that is, in computing whether it is a legal rate of interest, usury, the prepayment penalty never comes into account in the computation. <laughs> really? Don't laugh. There's a reason for it. Yes, I was going to You know why? Yeah. Who said it? 
Because you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay it. You're not obligated. Usury is only when you're obligated to pay for the use of the money. But go ahead. Okay, but even though you're not obligated to pay it. Um, when the lender uses that to increase the, their yield, isn't it because they figure that they might, or they just want to no. guarantee that they get no, a no, certain No, 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 no. They, they, made, they made a deal with you. Yeah. And the deal with you is, in exchange for my giving you a fixed 5% loan for five years, uh -huh. you're not going to give the money back to me. Because I know, and I can do my other business planning and, mm -hmm. and whatever else I have to do, knowing that I'm going to get 5% on that investment. Because remember, oh, okay. to you it's a loan. To bank, I'm not pointing at me, but to it's bank, a, it's, a, it's an investment. Yeah, yeah. So, so they know, just like if you were to go out and put money in a CD in the bank, you know that bank's going to pay you interest of that CD rate for X. So you know that, that you could use that money coming in for a car payment or a house payment or whatever you need that money because you know that money's coming in. Okay. Same basically with the bank. So now, for you to change the contract, there's a cost. Okay. And, and here, they only impose the cost after, see this paragraph right? Away? Sorry, I'm not super familiar. This is what I'm talking about. See where the bold starter prepayment penalty payment is? What that's talking about is, if you see, following the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, okay? That means that the project is finished, that the government says it's done and it can be used and it can be occupied. So when that happens, that if you remember back on the first page, that's when we went from an adjusted mortgage based upon the prime rate to a fixed rate. So now they say, okay, and this is a, I guess this is a five year loan, so it's three, two, one is how this works. Um, 3% of a prepayment penalty, which is 3% of the outstanding amount. So if this is a fully dispersed loan and it's $14 million, that 3% is a big chunk of money. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you where that comes in strategically in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 3% of it's made in the year, <coughs> the first year after the conversion to the fixed rate. Then 2%, then 1%. And then after the last, it can be prepaid at any time. That's usually the last year or so of the loan. Now on longer term loans, Let's say it's a 15 or 20 year term before it's due. It'll usually be five, four, three, two, one in the first five years, and after that you can prepay it. The other way to do a prepayment penalty is what's called a, a yield maintenance. Also beyond the scope of this course, but and, and we'll leave that to the finance course. But basically, what happens is the bank has made an agreement with you; they're going to have that five percent return for five years. Now, you say, I'm selling my project, uh, I, I want to pay the loan back. You're shortchanging the bank on their return. So now you're going to give them back $14 million. The interest rates have come down 75 basis points, three quarters of a, of a percentage point. Now the bank has to go and take the money and reinvest it, mm -hmm. but they're going to get less money. Mm -hmm. They made a bargain with you, and you're making them lose money on the bargain. Yield maintenance says you're going to pay the difference. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a gamble from the borrower's standpoint because you're talking about you're talking about a floating rate, you don't have no idea what's going to happen. Conversely, in a rising interest rate environment, the that yield maintenance is going to reverse and there may be zero. Yeah. So now you might say why in the world is a borrower going to spend all this money, which could be like I said, could be three percent of fourteen million dollars? Why are they going to spend all that money to pay it off early? Why don't they just keep the loan? Well, a couple of things happen that, that could cause that. They could get an, they could somebody could make them an offer they can't refuse with a huge profit in the building. Uh, if that's the case, then the, it just works out to make the payment. More likely, it's a situation where the interest rates have dropped, and they get an offer to go for a longer term at a lower rate. They're, they're going to have to eat some cash to do this, but over a long period of time, if, if their goal is to hold the building and continue to operate it, it's going to be beneficial to them. So, hold on one second. The, the, next, the next section is the late charge.
that's real easy. Everybody is familiar with a late charge. <laughs> you don't pay your payment on time, they're going to hit you with a late charge. Of course, remember, when you're talking, if you do your math and you're talking about $14 million at 5% payable monthly, and the late charge is 5% of the payment due, that's a significant good word. Angela, sorry. Yeah. So you mentioned a, a word that I, I don't think I've heard since I was a kid. Um, usury? It, is that at the state or a fed level? State. That's a state by state. Usury, usury? Well, the reason you, don't, you haven't heard about it is because the rates are low. And they've been low for a long time. It doesn't mean there aren't loan sharks out there. Right. But what happens is if you, if you charge an illegal rate of interest and it varies from state to state, when you beyond a certain interest rate, which is typically 18% for most things, it goes to 25% over half a million, uh, it's illegal. And you can forfeit your interest. Okay. Thank you. Then we start to get to the nasties. <laughs> Well, what happens? So, what happens if you don't make your car payment? Take your car. Take your car yes. What happens if you don't make your house payment? Take it away. Okay, so it gets to the same thing, and that's going to be where we're going to kind of segue into the mortgage. But first, we're going to talk about this last paragraph says exactly that. What happens if you don't make if you're in default? Well, on a construction loan, there's a lot more defaults than just not making your payment. But for our purposes, let's talk about a payment default. The first thing they can do is they can bounce the interest rate up, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you see the capitalized letters in there? Mm -hmm. At the maximum interest rate permitted by Florida law, as I just, go ahead. That's, so that's not anything that's stated in, that, in the previous maximum interest permitted by Florida law means the maximum usury rate that we can charge. Yes. Get the heck out of here. Well, wait a minute though, but you're bad now. Now you're bad, now, you, now you've defaulted, okay? So now you've breached the contract. And this is this is so I could charge. So technically you could charge someone almost twenty percent. How about twenty-five in this particular one? This is over five hundred thousand oh. dollars. Now you're 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 it's offended your sensibilities. But remember, the bank has loaned fourteen million of its shareholders hard. No, I, I get it, because I'm 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 looking at it how much money you can make as the bank. No, no, but you can't <laughs> make the no, wait, wait, wait. I want to be the okay, bank. But, Remember something. This is not a situation where you want you're doing this involved. because the bank is looking to make money. Okay, they can't just put the money out there because nobody's going to come to them for that. Remember, you're not if, in, in, in a five percent interest rate environment. No one's going to come to you and borrow money at twenty five percent. This is it's what's called I'm going to give you Latin legal words an interorum clause. It's to terrify you. Mm. It's to tell you that this is what's going to happen because again, if you go ahead and even interest only. Figure out 25% per annum divided by 12 months yeah. on $14 million. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Okay? So that's so the purpose of that is if you go into default, it compensates the bank for all the nasty things that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's also other there's waivers. Um, there's people, everybody that's everybody that signs the note is liable. And then it talks about, okay, so. The note is secured by a mortgage. Okay, Broward County, there, there's, there's the answer I'm looking for, it's the hotel. Um, I was trying to see which property I'm talking about so I can, because that's actually a more complicated uh, property to deal with the stabilization for. So it, talked, so it, it then starts to refer to the other documents, particularly the mortgage. There's also a recitation, you'll see at the bottom of that first, um, first paragraph on this page, that the documentary stamp taxes have been paid. They were fixed to the mortgage at the time the mortgage is recorded. The reason for that recitation is that if you have a promissory note and the documentary stamp tax has not been paid, you cannot enforce that in a court of law. Of course, it says the notes are forcible in the state of Florida. The typical when you have Florida real estate, but you'd be surprised when you're dealing with some of the securitized financing uh, where you have these big New York lenders doing bond financing that you can't just assume it's a Florida law. Sometimes it's going to say it's going to be enforced by the laws of, of New York or Delaware or some other state, except for the real estate aspects related to the mortgage. Um, one second. Of course, relatively simple stuff. You can't change it orally, you know, like 
Well, the banker told me I didn't have to make my payments. <laughs> you, you, I, I know it's funny, but I, I had a client. He's always got issues. He's always in trouble. He's just <laughs> nuts. I'm sorry. So when things were not doing really well, he was having trouble with his cash flow. He didn't pass real estate taxes. Yeah. And he says the banker said to him, pay this year's taxes. We'll take care of the, the two ta years that are delinquent. Sure. Okay. Sure. You get it in writing. They were trying to work with him. They were, make, they were basically advance the money for the other taxes. Now, it's done. I understand. If we get to workouts and things like that, these kinds of concepts occur. So he never got it in writing. The bank got sold two or three times. Of course, that banker vanished to the winds. And now we get to the point where they wake up and realize that he has a deficit. To, oh, I think he was going to pay them off. I think he was getting ready to pay them off. And when he thought he owed them $300,000, they said, no, you owe us $900,000. Because not only did we advance the taxes, but you were in default for failure to pay the taxes. And we've been accruing at the 25% rate. OK? So now they started to fight, obviously. At the end of the day, he had no proof that the banker said, do this or don't do this, because the bank had no proof that he agreed to pay any extra interest or any of this stuff. They resolved it, but it cost him a lot of money. Mm. So this one little teeny sentence is so vitally important. Anytime you have a contract like this, where someone has spent this much paper to document the loan, it's not, hey, Joe told me it's OK not to make my payment. And then the, the big bold that you're going to see in almost every sophisticated contract in today's world is a waiver of trial by jury. And uh, it's got to be, I believe under Florida law, it has to be prominent. So it's usually in all caps, sometimes all caps and bold. When you're dealing with things like $14 million loans, you don't want to be in front of six or 12 people who have not been sophisticated enough to come up with an excuse to get out of jury duty. <laughs> That's the argument. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. All right. Take a, we're going to take a breath from the note for a little bit for the loan documents because I'm going to I'm going to get into what the next documents are. And of course, like I said, they're a little uh, they're a little heavy, and I, I probably could have gotten lighter and brought a residential note and mortgage in here, but that's like beyond. <laughs> and and besides which. That doesn't give me the opportunity to get into the more sophisticated loan documents that make up. This is actually kind of like Denny's. It's a short stack. Right. They, 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 they come much, much worse. I, I, there was one thing I wanted to talk about, because uh, I buried a piece of paper here, in talking about the wire transfers and the cash and such. And that is the, um, what does this stand for? FinCEN. Oh, I'm using, a, I'm using a, an acronym. It's a financial. It's a financial reporting requirement of the federal government, and this was actually a secret for a long time. I don't understand why they did this. It's confidential. The closing. They, they've recently changed it so it's no longer confidential. So closing agents had to enforce it. They couldn't tell anybody that it existed. So in, this is dealing with a cash purchase of. Residential real estate by an entity, corporation, limited liability company, partnership, trust, things like that. They take trust out again. They keep going back and forth on this. So they, then it's limited. It is a geographic targeting order. They're going to pick out where are the bad guys and where are they burying money through entities. These are like for criminal activities, uh, people from other countries trying to bury money and such. So if, and this is just the local one, because I think there's areas of New York as well that it applies to, maybe California. If the transactions, now I'm talking about a, a, a purchase without a mortgage, the transaction allows a purchase of one or more residential pieces of real property in Dade, Brown, or Palm Beach counties, $300,000 or more purchase price, Corporation, limited liability, company, partnership, or other similar legal entity, not a human. And the purchase, the purchaser purchases without a bank loan, and it's paid for by currency, cash money, mm -hmm. cashier's checks, certified checks, traveler's checks, money orders, 
business or personal checks or wire transfers, you have to fill out a form and report it to the federal government. It's like an extension of the dirty cash, but it's how do you have so much money to buy this big house what if, in an entity? What if you, you just move us from a brokerage account? Well, then you don't care about the, okay. You oh, so you're saying oh, that does only pertains to cash. Like no, 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 no. It could be any of, you could be wire, checks, anything. But it's not you, a human. Yeah. It's when, it's, it's when. I put it in a corporation and right. put name of a LLC. Right. What's the big deal? Buying a house, residential property. Yeah. Over 300000 Yeah. I, I, done that. I didn't know that. Welcome aboard. Can I have your uh, social security number, please? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. It's, well, because it was a secret. Mm. Uh -huh. Stupid that a federal regulation like that would be confidential. You're not supposed to tell anybody about it. They just took the confidentiality away. Things are nuts. I mean, there, there, are, there are things that go on that are just a little crazy. I was crazy. thinking about that earlier. I'm pretty crazy. I want to tell you something up. So that's all I can do. Okay, so let me let me get away a little bit from um, the detail of the loan documents and talk a little bit about the loan process. And I, I have a feeling that based upon some of the sophistication I'm getting from some of you, you've had some experience with some of these elements, but when we talked about the financing contingency of the contract a little bit, we didn't really spend much time talking on how a loan gets approved. And this, this deals with both residential and commercial equally. There's two real basic elements of approving a loan by a bank for purchase of a piece of property. What is the purpose the, who's going to borrow the money and who's going to have the responsibility for paying the money back? That's one way. That's credit history, uh, financial wherewithal, income, experience in operating commercial property, and things like that. The other is the property itself. And why is the property itself so important to the process? Well, if you remember when I was just babbling through that ridiculous promissory note a few minutes ago, it made reference to a mortgage. We're going to talk about the details of the mortgage later, but the mortgage is the instrument that encumbers the real estate that secures the promissory note. Remember the example, if you don't pay your car payment, they take your car away. If they don't take your house, if you don't make your house payment, they take your house away. Well, they can't just walk in and take the keys away from you. There's a legal process. The mortgage is what defines the legal, gives them the rights to do it, uh, and creates other obligations. We'll get to that in a minute. So, What's important when they're going to use that um, property for collateral to secure the repayment, yeah, they decided they trust you, that, that you have the ability to pay, but just in case something happens and you don't, they want to know they're going to get their money back. Very simple rule of thumb, return of principal is more important than return on principal. You want to get your, you want to get your money back in your pocket more important than how much you're going to make on your money. So. How do they determine that the property is worth enough to make a loan? You know, we have a $14 million loan over here that we're just talking about for the construction loan. Or it could be you know, a $500,000 house. Principles are the same. The answer is a property appraisal. An appraisal is an estimate of the, of the value of the property. It is done by a professional person, uh, a, a, an appraiser, using standards. and using various valuation approaches. One valuation approach is called the market or sales comparison approach. This takes a look at the property that's being oh, appraised and, and they see, okay, what is, how does this compare to similar properties? And then what are the differences between the <coughs> similar properties? Because not one of the things about real estate is no two pieces of real estate are exactly the same. So has anybody here ever seen a, a residential appraisal? Okay, good. So in a residential appraisal, or any appraisal, commercial residential, they start off by saying, okay, these three or four properties are similar in nature. Um, it gets much more complicated with commercial property because commercial properties are much more different from each other than houses. And sometimes an appraiser has to go a distance away to a different part of town to find a comparable property. 
So they, they take the similarities and the differences, and through the course of it, and I don't think I have, bear with me a second, looking for some more graphics, because I know we all like that. No, I didn't bring that stuff. Um, how, many, how many of you got the textbook? Okay, I mean, it's not mandatory, it's a good background, I don't want to point to it, but it had, it had pictures of appraisals and things, it's not, certainly don't go spend necessarily, like I said, primarily we're going to be working off of, of the presentation, but if you feel that you need background to any of this, the textbook is a good place to look. So, they make adjustments, they say, okay, this property is similar to this property, this property has three bedrooms, this property has three bedrooms, and a den. So there's a little a plus or a minus comparing it to the property being appraised. That's the comparison approach. Then there's the sales approach. How much do the actual properties, similar properties, sell for as compared to what they're valued on? There's a cost approach, very important in construction related financing because they want to know how much will it cost to replace this? How, what is it going to cost to rebuild the building? We have a, a school building here. If this school building gets destroyed by a hurricane, what is it going to cost to rebuild it? So if you're going to build another school building three miles away, and they're looking to appraise it, they're going to look at how much, what it, is there an increase in the cost of concrete, steel, wiring, labor, things like that. Income approach. This is very important with commercial property. What's it going to generate? Um, how many units are there? And again, we're getting into some into the finance things, but this is absolutely this is the way the appraisals are done. And it's an analysis that's used for the investment in a piece of real estate by a buyer. I mean, a developer, anybody, you're going to go and look at a, an office building, and you find that that office building is half empty. So the income is vastly reduced. But you may also realize that with a very little bit of effort, you're going to fill it up, and the income potential is going to be much greater. So using the income approach and how much income the property is generating or could generate will help determine the value. Those, so the appraisals figure out the value of the property. Then the bank makes a decision as part of the loan approval process, something called loan-to-value ratio. And that is very, very simple. It just says, what percentage of this valuation that we've determined are we going to loan? And the reason that's so important is it, it mitigates the bank's risk. Because you, we've seen bubbles in the real estate market in South Florida. Um, values go up, values go down, and what happened the last time that was so disastrous for the banking industry was they were loaning into the bubble. So when the house was worth $600,000 and they were loaning 80% of that, they were loaning $450,000, $480,000 on that house, all of a sudden the bubble popped. That $600,000 house was now worth $430,000 with a $480,000 loan on it, that's a problem. Because now the bank forecloses, they don't get their money back because they can't sell it for what they have invested in it. The borrower goes, I'm broke. Somebody, somebody's losing some money. Okay? I'm not quite sure where that, that money went, but somebody lost a lot of money. Um, you can read all kinds of stories, all kinds of articles, but if you think about it, at some point in time, that money was laid out by that bank for the purchase of that property. It actually went out of somebody's pocket into somebody's pocket. Yeah, money, um, money does, money, money's like matter, right? It doesn't evaporate. That's a right? very good analogy. Mm -hmm. It didn't, it had to go somewhere. It had to come from somewhere. Okay. Give it to the government, it doesn't like 80 cents come back. Like every dollar of government spending is like 20 cents of inefficiencies or anything like that. Evaporating matter. Finance class, please. Oh, we're staying here. Okay. So that's the appraisal process. So then you get into something called underwriting. Underwriting in the banking world is called underwriting because the word purgatory was already taken. <laughs> <laughs> if you're trying to close on a transaction and no one will give you an answer as to why you're not being approved or why the approval process is taking so long, they're going to say it's an underwriting. As a practical matter, underwriting means the evaluation of the property of the borrower. They'll never tell you what they're doing. They'll never tell you what the standards are. It's all internal in each financial institution. There are no regulations. There's no magic things there. There are guidelines they'll give you that you shouldn't um, 
that your, your monthly payment on your mortgage shouldn't be more than X percentage of your monthly income, that your debt shouldn't be more than X percentage of your total assets, things like that. When it comes to commercial, it's a little more sophisticated. They're looking at loan-to-value ratios. They're looking at, at um, they call, that there's financial ratios saying that your income, net operating income from the property has to be, it's usually one and a quarter. Debt service covered. Oh, debt service 125. Covered. Debt service covered. Thank you. I'm not, yes, debt service covered. See? Good. I, I knew it. It's stuck back there. You described it perfect. Okay. One, three. Basically, they're saying that you are making more money with a cushion from the net operating income from the property than what you're having to pay to the bank to cover your debt. And it, it's a little bit of leeway because what happens is, unfortunately, you have a building and you've got your loans on there and you've got your debt service coverage and then a tenant leaves. It happens. The tenant goes out of business, the lease is up, something, and all of a sudden you have a reduction in income. Well, if a bank is nasty, if you've got a low interest rate loan in a, in a rising market and the bank wants to be nasty about it, if you don't make your debt service, co debt service coverage ratios, they can call the loan. They can say you're in default. But we're going to get into a loan agreement in a minute. Um, just oh, okay. Another provision. Uh, well, let's let me let me get into. Let me. I want to. Okay. I'm going to go and I'm going to show you part of the approval process for a typical commercial loan. Hopefully, my paralegal did. Oh, it's my fault. Hold on. Here, the name in there. Sorry. Anyway, I, we tried to redact this as best we could. Redact means hide. Oh, there we go. That's, see, friendly worker. Sorry. Um, so this is a loan closing checklist. You can tell because at the top it says loan closing checklist. <laughs> and what this is, and I'm not going to kill you with this or spend too much time on it, but this is a list of things that the, the bank and their lawyers are going to give. At the, at, once you get approved for the closing, now these are the things that go into the closing process for the closing to take place. And this is a construction loan. This, this relates to the same promissory note. So the first thing is the commitment letter. The commitment letter is a sort of a contract. If I say it loosely that way, the bank says, we have approved your loan. And if you do the following eight pages of detailed things, we'll give you the money. So it's really so difficult to enforce that against the bank because they can point to any of the littlest details on those eight pages that they could say you didn't satisfy this loan requirement, therefore we can't close it. So they talk about various searches. Hold on a second. I'm sorry, because this is, this is pointing a weird way. Are we straight? Close to straight? Okay, so you see it says open permit, municipal lien, violation search, title insurance, title agent agreement. These are all things, BC is borrower's counsel, by the way. That, that's my job to make sure if I, my client gets the, wants the money, I have to make sure that all these conditions are satisfied for the bank. So all of these things are related to the quality of title so that the bank is assured that, they're, that they are going to be in first position on their mortgage. And we'll talk about loan priority a little later. All the different searches, you see UCC1 federal bankruptcy search, and then we're gonna get, are we into organizational documents? Okay. They wanna know that the company exists. So there's all these things that they want to know about the company. Then if there's a, a loan being paid off, they wanna know that you have paid off letters. Um, they wanna know if there's any brokers involved because brokers come out of the woodwork and demand payment and cause troubles. Um, but they want, they want a list of who's supposed to get paid. They want, you see there's a requirement at number nine for environmental uh, conditions to be satisfied. It's usually a search to make sure that the property is not contaminated. Then they want various agreements and we're going to talk about some of those agreements and, and why the bank needs protection, especially on a construction loan. Zoning letter, because if they're going to loan you $14 million to build something, they want to know that you have the legal authority to build on the site. Uh, same with the building permits. And then we're going to get into various certificates. So 
the loan closing checklist typically goes on and on and on with things that you have to produce to the bank uh, in order to satisfy them to get to a closing. Question. So, so whenever it was the zoning and the permits, do they also usually require a, a developer's agreement? Or like a, a development agreement from the municipality? No. No? That, that's, it, depends on the, it depends on the scope. Okay. Depends on the scope. We're talking, right here we're talking about one piece of property, not a, okay. Okay. Not, not a large, not Weston. We're talking right now because it's, it's another question of real estate development. Then I'll get more into those kind of details. I don't want to overdo it. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the mortgage. Because I have another construction loan closing checklist that's even worse. But I don't want to, again, I don't want to make you crazy. Oh, by the way, um, based upon what happened last week, sometime around 2.30, we're going to stop for milk and cookies. <laughs> you want the cookies? No, I'll bring your own milk and cookies. <laughs> because, because there might be, you know, something in it. You've got to be careful nowadays, you know? The only thing that is safe to serve to people in public generally is ice. <laughs> I don't even know about that. Dare I do this to you? Okay. Let me talk about the nature of a mortgage. A mortgage is a contract between the owner of the property and the bank. The first and most important legal concept with the mortgage in dealing with these things is the mortgage follows the note. That's important. The mortgage has no life without an obligation because the mortgage is there to secure an obligation, to attach the obligation to the property. Back to the, back to the example of a car loan. When you borrow money to buy a car or lease a car, either way, what happens is the title is actually either retained by the person that's owned the money or it's, there's a, a lien filed on it and that's registered in Tallahassee to show that there was a lien on that vehicle. It's not quite that simple with a mortgage. A mortgage is recorded in the public records, but it's not centrally filed. You have to do a title search to find the mortgage. The mortgage secures the promissory note. The mortgage always follows the note. So we talked about how a mortgage gets approved, the underwriting, and all those things. There are two different ways to create a mortgage. In Florida, we are a lien theory state. A lien theory state, in a lien theory, we continue to own our property, but there's a legal encumbrance upon it. This legal encumbrance is uh, 11 pages long. This is a simple one. Some of the longer. So in a title theory state, you actually are conveying the property to a third party trustee who's going to hold title to your property for the benefit of your lender until you pay it back or until um, something bad happens. But the mortgage, the mortgage has other obligations in it besides just the payment of money. And that's where they get, because it would be very easy to say, pay the money when we take your property. That wouldn't take a whole lot of words. It's also more than just the real estate. I don't want you to spend too much time reading this paragraph, these two paragraphs here, but the top paragraph, in addition to describing in the mortgage the legal description of the property being conveyed, you're going to see that it also includes all of those things, buildings, structures, improvements of every nature whatsoever. That's kind of broad. Um, anything on the property, furniture, furnishings, fixtures, machinery, equipment, inventory, materials. Lawyers like to go on and on and on and on with extra words. Everything isn't enough. You have to say everything and then say what everything is. It's just, you know, you can pay by the word. Don't, don't have to tell you otherwise. Okay, so then the next paragraph, those, so those are, the next paragraph goes on and there's more. All in singular, the tenements, hereditaments, easements, what in the world am I talking about? Tenements and hereditaments. Basically, we're talking about rights. So whatever rights that borrower has to that property go along with the mortgage. So that if the bank steps in and takes the mortgage over, they step into the shoes of the borrower when they acquire title. And even though this looks like an extremely complete paragraph, 
there are 27 other documents here that repeat this, because like I said, repetition is how we make our living. You'll also see in paragraph C, can we see paragraph C? Mm -hmm. Sorry that I have to keep doing that back and forth, because I'll get used to this silliness. I will figure out how to use this, which where it's a little more clear the next time. Um, I didn't know if we were going to be in here or not, and have the use of this thing. So in C, you'll see riparian rights. Anybody know what that is? No. River. River. Right. Okay. Water. Yeah. What? I don't, I don't know whether to say water rights, but you know, that, there don't want to be any mystery. But then it talks about leases, rents, deposits, profits, licenses, all the things that go with it. It's part of the bundle of rights that the borrower has that they're giving to the bank. So that if the bank takes this property over, not only do they get the sticks and stones, but they get the right to the, the rent money from the tenants, the operating revenue if it's an operating company, an operating property like a hotel, or anything like that. All of these, these three paragraphs try and cover everything in addition to the simple title to the real estate. So then it goes on to all the various conditions, and I'm not going to drag you through each and every clause, but it, the first and most important is the payment of the money. Obviously, that, that's fairly easy. Um, and then it goes on, again, I'm going to repeat myself because I'm repeating about the repetitiousness. It's from the Department of Redundancy Department. This is, separate, <laughs> this is separate from the, the contract between the owner, if you, like you're purchasing it from an individual. You're, this is with you and the bank. Bank, you, correct. Right? This is, all we're doing, yes, this is, all these contracts are between the property. You already bought the property now. Okay, or actually once after you sign it, the bank gives the money, then you bought the property. So all these, all these things that you're saying that the bank can get if, if you default on the loan, um, they, you must have those from the original contract. Some of those things you, won't, you might not have, like well, you might not have water rights, you might not have... Well, you may, it basically all comes together. When you, once you close, you get the whole bundle of sticks, with very, very few exceptions. You get everything that the seller had, That's especially right. if it's a, a construction site like this. You're going to get everything. You're going to get all kinds of rights, plus rights that you will create, and you'll see about those when we get into some of the other nasty documents. But there, if there are restrictions from when you purchase the property from the owner, that will go into the mortgage thing too because the bank can't think he's going to get something that he's not entitled to, right? Correct. Those, those restrictions are going to be in the title. Yeah. They're going to be in the title commitment and eventually the title policy. And I will do, I'm going to do a unit on hopefully on title and try and get into that in some great detail. But what happens there is those are things that come ahead of the mortgage. They come ahead of the owner. There's a basic principle, and this is an important one because it, it deals not only with general property interests, but it deals with different mortgages as well. First in time, first in right. So there, you can have a mortgage that's created today, which is a first mortgage, and then on Tuesday another mortgage gets signed that's recorded against the property, and that would be a second mortgage. So the one that comes first is in first priority, the one that comes later is in second priority. If those restrictions were created last year, the mortgage is recorded today, restrictions come ahead. Now, there are situations where there are elements of restrictions that by their terms are subordinate to the bank. For example, if you look at any declaration of condominium or almost every homeowners association documents, you will see that there's a provision that if the bank steps in and takes over the property, the bank will not be responsible to pay the condominium maintenance that happened prior to their acquisition, with the exception of one year or one percent, because the associations were getting clobbered, and so they slid this in there to say that, and the bank will pass that along to the next buyer, but, so there is a minimum. So yes, the bank is subject to all the restrictions of a record. So in your first in, first in time, first in right. And right. That's a paramount principle, it's very important. That, would that then That's, that's a buzzword, by the way, that means going to be on the test. No, I, I liked it. I wrote it down, but I didn't like it. But I'm trying to figure out how that relates to property taxes. Because property ah, taxes stay are... Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Okay. I'm going to get there in a minute. Okay. okay? So, a funny thing about that is the next paragraph here. Look, let's get to the bottom of this page. Can we see the bottom of this page? I'm trying not to do that. Yes. See what 2A says? Yeah. Mortgage owner will pay all government taxes and covenants and other assessments, levies, reliefs, now thereafter, blah, 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 okay? And then it says, if not, 
if not paid prior to becoming delinquent, mortgagee may at its option pay same without waiving or affecting mortgagee's option to foreclose. So there's really only two things that can come ahead in the mortgage. One, the hurricane blows the building down and the collateral goes away and now there's just vacant land. Two, real estate taxes. The government comes first. So the real estate taxes, you can never get ahead of them. Priority. They're there. If you want, if you will, they go back to when the state was created if you want to use them first in time, first in right. Okay. So the bank protects himself. How many people own a house or a mortgage? Anybody? A house or an apartment or something? Okay. Do you have an escrow payment as part of your mortgage? Okay. The reason for that is the only thing that can come ahead of the mortgage in the real world is real estate taxes. So the bank wants to make sure they're paid. And unless the bank trusts you that you have enough money to pay them on an annual basis, they're going to take the money from you on a monthly basis, put it to the side, and pay your tax bill for you. That protects them. How, how does that work in, like in Florida, we don't have a state tax, right? We don't have an estate tax, right? We're talking about two different We're talking, I know. So, like in, in places, like in New York, there's a... You have a property tax by the, from the state of New York, right. and then you have another tax that you like. You have two taxes. We have city tax. Yeah, city tax. Ah, that's right. I guess what they call same it. thing. It's okay. just multiple layers of the same thing. Which one would be prioritized? I don't. It's pr they're probably equal in dignity. They probably all come ahead of the mortgage. So, like if they foreclose, no. Okay, there's no mortgage. If they foreclose, who would get the property first? first is my question. That's between the state and the county. Yeah. It's, it's between the state, yeah, state and county. I don't know the answer to that because because the county and the city are both political subdivisions of the state. Mm -hmm. So back to the state. Remember, so then the state will own the property. The state and the money goes to different places yeah. and, it's, and it's allocated for different things. But in terms of priority, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a very good. That's an interesting question. So say there's. You know, the taxes aren't paid on the property, as you were saying. Is, it, is that when the municipality creates a tax lien? The lien, okay, good question. The lien of real estate taxes, and again, we're talking about the mortgage here more than title today, but the lien of real estate taxes is always there. It's a question of when it becomes enforced. A, a real estate tax lien is always on the property. Okay. It's, it's whether they're delinquent or not delinquent that becomes a problem. Other kinds of state liens become priority upon being filed. For example, if you have a business and you don't pay your sales tax, they, the state of Florida can issue what's called a tax warrant. And they record that and it's just like a judgment and it becomes a lien on your property except for your homestead. So then the, the real estate itself is always encumbered by the state? Yes. Okay. That's why that's why the mortgage is always supported. That's why the mortgage has protections in it. Um, so if they don't pay it, if you don't pay it, the bank has the right to pay the real estate taxes on your behalf and to charge you interest on it. That was my example. I was talking about the crazy client before. So, so they do that to protect from them auctioning off Correct. the tax liens and then have to compete with that right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So... The next, the next provision, and again, it's, the words are not as important as the concepts here. Um, and I am going to circulate, if I can, once I figure out the bulk mailing, I am going to circulate, uh, for those of you with insomnia, this package of documents so that you can study them in great detail. There is a provision in here that says in the event of a, of, that they go to foreclose the mortgage, they can go to the court and say to the court, we want someone to take over operation of the property. Um, you're doing a, the guy that was operating this hotel has failed, but he's still got a hotel full of guests. He's got reservations coming in, and his income coming in. But he's he knows we're going to foreclose, so he's going to steal the money and run. So we are now going to go to court, and we're going to ask the court to appoint a receiver, a person who's going to take over the property for the benefit of the bank and operate the property. Uh, and so this this provision gives them the right to do that. What, what number is that? That would be number four in this document. Can you put that into a lease? 
that if the, 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 the person who has the lease goes to bankruptcy or they, they're collecting Careful. money for their don't, default. Don't, 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 don't throw me. that word around One because second. that's got a whole bunch of different rights to it. I'm, if I'm, they I'm, go into default, the landlord comes in and throws them out. No, you don't have a receiver concept in a lease. But don't, don't confuse a financial receiver who's taking over a whole business with this kind of receiver. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you at the class because I don't want to confuse it. Okay. So. Hold on. Hold on. You're exceeding your allocation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other thing that I said besides the real estate taxes was what else can take the, make the mortgage not have collateral? Oh, okay. a hurricane. Good. Okay, somebody has, so, somebody's not turned to mush yet. I, I like that. So paragraph five goes on and talks about different kinds of insurance that the borrower is obligated to maintain on the property, including liability insurance, because liability insurance uh, keeps everybody from getting sued or, or protects it from getting sued if somebody trips and falls. Uh, a big judgment against the property can cause a problem for the bank. They can get the bank involved. It's not good, especially when there's construction involved. Um, so without going into too much detail on different kinds of insurance, you have your basic... Uh, Jumping ahead, great, I love it, I love it, I do love that. It's good, because you, you're, you're anticipating. You have casualty, fire, um, wind, wind is separate in Florida, it's not separate in other places, flood, because there's a separate program for that. Flood is rising water. When mm -hmm. you start walking around and you hear sloshing, that's usually the flood. Uh, the flood is not rain, it's not when the rain fills the basement up, that is not flood insurance, that's basic casualty insurance. Windstorm is a carve-out that was brought to you by your friends in the Florida insurance industry because basically they were getting murdered. Of course, then things happened like, okay, we're a big national insurance company. I'm not going to mention any names, but we're going to we're going to take all your money for your car. See? Guy, mm -hmm. Very cool. See my hands? Mm -hmm. Come on. Anybody? Boy, oh. And, but they all did this. I'm just I'm picking on Austin because I just. Uh, Anyway, are you in homes? <laughs> they make a huge amount of profit on car insurance in Florida, but they pulled out yeah. on, ho on property insurance because they were paying out too much money. You know, what insurance company doesn't want? It. They just want to take your money. They don't want to pay. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, you go to but, so what's happened is we've gotten lower levels of insurance coverage, and they pulled the windstorm and put it into a whole separate type of insurance with massive deductibles. I'm about to say it's crazy. Well. It's the only way that the insurance companies can, can, can afford to cover it at all because the damage is so expensive and so massive that without doing that, they'd be paying out so much more than they could charge you, and the rates would be so high. Remember, insurance rates are regulated. But so, so you couldn't afford the windstorm insurance. Yeah, I'm sure you can buy it with a lower deductible, but when you saw the premium, you, you just yeah, you, you faith. You couldn't do it. It's all an allocation of risk, and, and it's all that's all money. So they couldn't do it. So yes, windstorm and flood. Um, some states have requirements for earthquake coverage. Uh, all kinds of various things. Maybe earthquake coverage in California. I know, but what what kind of coverage? What would they call that? Earthquake coverage. Earthquake coverage. Earthquake coverage. Really? Yes. Yeah, right. I know there's something special with flood insurance in the, at the federal level. Do you care to touch on that? I know sure. very little. Absolutely. Um, so the, the flood insurance program is, is a nationally administered program. It's written usually by private underwriters, and it's based upon the likelihood that the property is going to suffer a flood or what might or how much it has flooded in the last 200 years. Uh, do I 200 have? years? Hang on. Okay. Let's see. Um, this, this may not be easy. Yeah, I'm never going to get this one, so just give up on me. Can we see that little section here? It's really small. <laughs> we can't read. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, what I'm trying to point to is right up in here. Okay? Okay. Yeah. No, it's not legible. I'm saying it's really not, it's not fair. Because the problem is, what I'm, what I'm working off of is an 8.5 by 11 version of a document that would normally is this big. Okay, this is a, um, 
it's usually done on a uh, PDF and it's sent to you in advance so you can check it. Of course, and we store them this way, so this, this is an older survey, not as old as the other one that was handwritten, but <laughs> they have the flood information on the survey, and it's tiny in what I'm holding in my hand, which is why that's not working. So they have flood zone elevations. They actually go, and there's two ways they do it. One is the little notations on the survey, and for insurance purposes, there's a whole separate sheet that you get with the survey that's a flood certificate. And that determines what actually the elevation of the lowest floor level in the property is compared to what's the likelihood of the water rising to that level in the area. And if it's in a certain zone, which I believe is flood zone X, they determine that it's not a flood risk. I think, remember, believe it or not, there are a few areas around South Florida that are higher than others. There, there are a couple of ridges. Um, you live in Davie, there's a ridge in Davie. Um, I'm not on the ridge. I'm, I'm but there are, there are ridges. <laughs> so basically, if you were to follow it, there's a couple of almost backbones that come down the state. Any of you go to West Palm Beach, as you're going in towards the downtown of West Palm Beach, you're actually going to go over a hill, right about where the Kravis Center is, or I guess oh, where yeah. the Bright Line tracks are. You're actually going over a hill. And that's like the backbone of the state that weaves its way down. If you go down to where, uh, are they calling it Marlin Stadium nowadays, I think, but just, it used, when it was, it used to be the Orange Bowl down in Miami, and if you go just a little bit to, to the street that runs on the west side of that, again, it's a ridge, it's a, it's, there's a hump there. Um, I, I'm trying to think of where it may be in Fort Lauderdale. In Davie, there were islands out there where it was a little bit higher, like at Flamingo Gardens and things like that areas that stuck up out of the swamp, but that's not so much what I'm talking about. So there are areas where there's a higher elevation where the floodwaters don't get. That's an X zone, it's exempt. We don't get flood insurance, believe it or not. And FEMA, FEMA which is the federal government's um, arm, they're there to protect you. They, uh, they will redo the maps periodically. They just did redo the maps to determine that certain areas that we thought needed flood insurance didn't. So, you have all these different requirements of, of insurance policies, which are almost as boring as loan documents. The mortgage also requires that the insurance policy name the mortgagee as a loss, additional loss payee on any of the property policies. And that, the purpose of that is to say that if there's a loss, and that this is the same even on a house policy, if there's a loss, that check is payable not only to the property owner, but the property owner and the bank jointly. And the reason for that is that they want to make sure that you're going to take that money and put it back in to repair the collateral so that the value of what they've got the loan on is still there. Okay? Next, they, they, you're not, you can't commit waste. Committing waste means um, not taking care of the property, letting the property deteriorate, letting the value of the property decrease. Uh, so, Waste, it's a legal term which means just that. Take care of your property. Um, I'm trying to see what other things. Oh, okay. So you can have multiple mortgages on a piece of property in varying degrees of priority. But the bank in a commercial mortgage will typically say, no, we're going to loan you 70% of the, of the value of the property. And we don't want you putting extra mortgages on there. We don't want you taking all your equity out. We want you to be invested in this property. So they can put a prohibition in the mortgage called a restriction on, few, on further encumbrances. And if you put a second or third mortgage on the property behind this, you will be in default and they can call the loan. Similarly, there's something called a due on sale clause. And a due on sale clause is a provision of mortgage that says, you cannot transfer the mortgage subject to the bank to the bank's mortgage. You can't transfer the property, sorry, subject to the bank's mortgage. That's a default. And the reason for that is they've made a contract with you to based upon your credit, your experience in operating the property. And if you transfer the property, which has more than one simple definition, then they can call the loan. Now you can ask their permission, if they consent, then of course it's okay. But in a, you convey any interest in the property could be a deed. It could be as simple as, hey, I'm going to bring in another partner on the property, and I'm going to sell my part. I'm going to sell the partner 50% of the property and give them a deed to half. Um, it could be a long-term lease because a long-term lease 
of the property is the same as a transfer. You're putting the operation of the property into the hands of another. Or, in the case of a, a property owned by an LLC, you could transfer uh, multiple percentages of membership so that, again, you're moving the control and or the beneficial interest of the property to another person without transferring the deed. No? Okay. It's also a default to, uh, put, uh, to, to allow a lien to be filed. If you're doing work on the property, they want to make sure it's paid for. Now, again, that can't come ahead of the mortgage, but it's a problem because it means that you're not satisfying your obligations. They will, you're not allowed to, con and I'm, I'm going through, I'm just glossing over paragraphs in the mortgage to give you an idea of prohibitions and restrictions. These are all covenants that are agreed to by contract between the borrower and the bank as a condition to the bank giving the borrower the money. You can't agree to file bankruptcy or to put a receiver or a liquidator or anything like that. Uh, yeah, obviously, it would mean you're going out of business. Um, there's a right here for the bank to inspect the property and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. For example, uh, if you are operating a hotel, they may want to come in and make sure that you're operating a hotel if you're not operating an illegal activity. They just want to look. They have the right to come and look. They ask for, there's a right here for them to come and ask for a statement saying that uh, things that, that you could agree to in the past are still true, that you haven't done anything bad to the property, that your financial statements are true and correct, those kinds of things. Oh, there's, there, there's a, one other thing besides real estate taxes. Uh, it's similar, but it's different, and that is the power of eminent domain. Eminent domain is a constitutional right coming from the federal constitutional level, whereby the government can take property from you for a public purpose for just compensation. Basically, that means they're going to put a highway through, or they're going to widen the street, more likely. Uh, they may decide that they need three lanes where there were two lanes. They need to put a right turn lane in to make it safer. Things along those nature. And that is called eminent domain. If that happens, nobody can prevent it. The only thing that you can argue about with the governmental entity is how much they're going to give you. And that goes back to the appraisal battles. They're going to say it's worth this, you're going to say it's worth that. You reach an agreement, it's usually settled. Um, it's, a, it's a whole separate legal practice. And in fact, by statute in Florida, if the state comes in and takes your property away from it, and you do have to fight over value, the state has to pay your attorney's fees. Mm, that's cool. Like, you get a good yeah. attorney. Well, what's that? Well, you should get you know the best attorney to argue. Exactly. Well, because you know you're fighting you're fighting them, and it's your property that's being taken, and you should be able to fight fairly. When you lose, yeah. you get the, you get the. You don't the lose. Difference. You you you're gonna lose the property. That that's a given. <laughs> that's the state. <laughs> well, no, I don't mean like lose the. Problem. You're going to get paid for it. And so you, it's, you're losing the property for just compensation. It's a forced sale of a portion of the property for public use. So that they pay for the guy who negotiates to get you a better deal. Correct. But, but like sometimes complex. it's negotiation and sometimes it's trial. Okay. Trial? Trial. Yeah, sometimes they take it trial. too far. Yeah. Trial. Because what happens is now, now you negotiate and you cannot reach an agreement mm -hmm. on what the property is worth because the fact that you've now taken it from 100 feet in depth to 75 feet in depth, mm -hmm. it determined, determines that you can't put um, enough, enough vertical construction. Okay. There's a, there's, in development, there's a concept of density. So you have to have this much land to put this much building. Okay. If you have 50,000 square feet of land, I'm, I'm making numbers up. If you have 50,000 square feet of land, you can build five stories. If you have 40,000 square feet of land, you can build four stories. Mm -hmm. I'm, please, I'm making this up mm -hmm, okay, for mm -hmm. ease of math. So now if they take 10,000 10, square feet of land because they're taking a strip to put another lane in, all of a sudden, your, the building that you can build under that construction loan is going to be worth a lot less money to you yep. because it's... You're losing a whole story. You're losing X units if it's a rental or a hotel. You're losing dollars in income. It's all things that have to be proven. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and forth. So there is, you know, you could have a trial to that. Um, another situation with eminent domain, sidebar, it's okay. It's a, 
I try to keep this as broad as possible. More common in a situation where you're going to, it, really the most common condemnation is road frontage, increasing the size of the road in front of the property. Parking. So when it's like that, they don't, the state, I mean, they don't sweeten the deal for you to just take. It's a negotiation. I mean, it's like anything else, how much, how much sweeter, if you're the state, mm -hmm. and I'm screaming and whining, that, and, I'm, and I'm telling you that I'm going to get $800 a night from this hotel on Federal Highway mm -hmm. in Dania Beach, you think I'm going to get $800 a night? Would you pay $800 a night to stay on Federal Highway? No. 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 Okay, so I'm, I'm complaining because you've just taken a whole floor from my hotel. Okay. All right? You say, well, you know, it's more likely you're going to get $175 a night in Dayton Beach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, my hotel is so beautiful. Yeah. Okay, back and forth and back and forth, and you agree on $225 a night. That, the math works, and case is settled. Okay. That's how it works. That's okay. what, so you can call it sweet, you, you just call it. Inflate the price so you can meet in the middle. Like, not Everybody less. thinks their property is worth more than it really is. Of course. That's, that's the reality of life. Yes. Can you only buy property? Can you also argue like how it's inconvenient for that person? No, you can't. No. Well, okay. So the answer is no. It's a, it's an absolute right for the state. Where you can have a fight, it's not a question of inconvenience. But there was a, a there's a major U.S. Supreme Court case mm -hmm. that took place in Connecticut, mm -hmm. um, where normally you see a situation where, like I said. Probably the most common is street widening or something like that. In the, in the city of New London, Connecticut, there was a situation where the city decided that this area of town had gotten seedy. And they wanted to make it nice. You see lots of areas around South Florida that a while ago were garbage, and now all of a sudden they've renovated, they've put, brought in yeah. new businesses, they've made it nice again. Um, I was just last night, I was in Midtown Miami, um, and when I was a kid, those were, there were, it was a railroad yard. It was junk. <laughs> there were, I mean, it was vacant land for a long, long, long time, and there was nothing around it. Now, there's high-rise apartment buildings, there's restaurants, there's major department stores, there's all kinds of things in there. So what happened in London, Connecticut was, they decided to use the power of eminent domain yeah. to take people's property, pay them for it, mind you. Yeah. And they were going to pay the fair market value as they're required to, but take the property and hand it over to a private developer to redo the whole area. Oh, wow. And the, the, this went to, through the court system saying that um, this is not a proper public purpose for eminent domain. Mm -hmm. And so it went through, and, and eventually got all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said yes. It is. There was one or two people that were actually saying, no, I want, you can't take my property for this. I don't care how much you pay me. I want my property. And they said, no, it's a, it is a valid public purpose. Redevelopment is a valid mm -hmm. public purpose. And it's OK for the city to designate a private entity to do the redevelopment for the purpose of fixing up this area. For the public good, in a way, basically. Correct. Yeah, I think the example I saw was like a car dealership or something like that that got possessed by the government. And, I, and it ended up being under private, changing hands to like a different private owner just for the benefit of the area. And, uh, for guess, what purpose? Uh, I guess Not better for than a car dealership. I guess, yeah, I guess better than a car dealership for the community. It, it, that's a little rough. I mean, mm -hmm. I, that, that's because you're going private to private. Mm -hmm. you're, it's a change of use. And really, a car dealership, even though, you know, depending on what it was, is typically not a blight. Mm -hmm. Unless maybe it was an old dealer that was sitting vacant for a long period of time. Um, so that's a tough one. I'd like to know what that was all, all about. It. But it, it is possible. So condemnation is another situation where the bank gets paid first, by the way. So it, that, that's, I went off on that tangent, getting back to the loan. But the concept is, it just like to sale the property. It is, and it is. It's just a forced sale. It provides here that the bank gets paid first. Same thing if it gets blown down and not restored. And one of the little quirky things about insurance and damages are the bank has the right, although I'm not going to say they don't ever use it, the bank has the right to say, you know what, we're not going to give you the money from the insurance to rebuild the property. We're going to take it and pay the loan off with it because we don't think you've done a good job here and 
um, it, you, you have failed, basically, and we don't want to loan you the money back to rebuild the hotel. So we're going to take the insurance money and apply it, and they, all, they always have the right. Where there is a problem, and this is, this is another interesting quirk, there are certain types of mortgages. Let's take, a, for example, an office park where you have five buildings that covered by a mortgage like this. And the mortgage has prepayment provisions in it that we talked about before that says you can't prepay unless you pay a penalty. In some types of financing, although it's rare, but if you're talking about heavy securitized financing, you absolutely can't prepay for a period of time. Uh, there's all kinds of special restrictions. Or you have to, but you can't, certainly can't prepay in part. You can prepay the whole thing, but not a piece. So now what happens is the hurricane comes through and it destroys one of five buildings. Now, under the way the most typical mortgages are written, the bank has the right to take the insurance proceeds and apply it to the loan. You don't have the right to prepay in part. You have no money. You can't fix the building. I've had to actually negotiate this kind of a clause, especially when you're dealing with lenders from other states that don't know about hurricanes and what hurricanes can do to a property. They're like, why are you bothering me on damage and destruction clauses? It's boilerplate. No, not down here it's not. Because in that very circumstance, you have to have exceptions in your documents to, to provide if there's partial damage and they take the money that you can make a partial prepayment without a penalty and, or pay the whole thing off without a penalty so you can get a, a full loan and rebuild the whole thing. Uh, typically, in every contract like this, there's going to be a provision for attorney's fees so that the bank has to enforce their rights. Uh, I'm into the miscellaneous stuff, I'm just taking a look at there's anything. Mortgage or agrees, like I said, to do everything they're supposed to do. Again, there's the waiver of trial by jury from the Department of Redundancy Department. A lot of this is, a lot of this is repetitive to what's in the note. And I'm not going to go through the miscellaneous stuff, and then they get signed and recorded. And having finished the mortgage, and before we go on, we're going to take our little cookies, right? Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Breathe. My cousin and I are trying to go to Hawaii next year. Hawaii? I'm going to rent a big old house and I'm going to do that tomorrow.
just it's a start at least. You gotta get better than that. Mm-hmm. That's another one.
trying to disbelieve anybody, it's just like a little check system, is I put out a challenge question. And it was a real tough challenge question. It was, what was the name of the document we were discussing for the entire lesson? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I got the answer, boom, I reversed it. That was one person. The other person didn't even wait for the challenge question. They, they responded with a paragraph of everything we were doing in class. So please don't take offense if I ask you for that. If you're not here, of course, if you're not here, you're not listening to it. But you know, if you have to, if it happens, and, and um, just understand that's why I'm doing it. Also, maybe I will recognize some of your names by the end of the, uh, uh, of the term. Don't count on that. I'm sorry. I'm being, I'm being honest with you guys, so, you know, the best I can do. All right, so I have to stay at this column. Anthony? Yes. Okay. Miriam? Yes. Thank you. Brandon? Bianca. Okay, I think she may have dropped. James Carter. Isabel Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Alex. Alex Cohen. He's here. He's going to the bathroom. Okay. Brian. <laughs> Leon, I know you're here. Bruce Fleming. Thank you. Cynthia. Christina. Dana. So that's good. Poor bad. It's up to you. Aaron? Aaron Lack? Adriana? Julia? Michael Oshkin? Sorry, no, the I promise to pay, um, how are you going to pay, what you're going to pay, why are you going to pay so much, interest, things like that. Then we go through the mortgage. The mortgage is the document that attaches the property to, uh, sorry, attaches the debt to the property, provides all kinds of obligations on the part of the borrower, and gives the bank the rights to come in and take over the property under certain circumstances where there's a default. That's the dirt. The real estate, and as I went through that paragraph on the mortgage, all the other things that come along with it. And I am going to do my best, once we figure this out, to send you this package of documents. Because they're just really fascinating to read. Um, this document is called the Collateral Assignment of Leases, Profits, and Rents. This document is an assignment to the bank of the right to receive the income from the property. Um, the right to take over all the leases, to take over all the um, all the operations of the property, and it is stated in the form of a present assignment. That's how it's okay. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. Um, so the, this goes on and you'll see it assigns all the stuff to the lender, 
And then it says, if you look at, it, at the, at, here, I can use the bounce, this a lot easier. Represents that no rent has been prepaid. So what, what you got to, what the borrower has to avoid doing under this circumstance, and it's technically a default under most, uh, most loans out there is, they go to the, the, the borrower goes to the tenants and says, listen, I'll give you a 5% discount on your rent if you'll pay me the whole year up front. What happens then is they make a deal between the, the tenant and the school. You remember, you could be talking about a lot of rent, a lot of money, and the borrower vanishes with the money. Now the bank who's been looking for this rent money to come in for to make the mortgage payments, the mortgage payments doesn't come, they knock on the borrower's door, he's gone. Goes to the tenant and says, hey, tenant, uh, you're supposed to pay the rent, pay it to me. And the tenant goes, look, I paid it to the borrower. So this is, this is actually a prohibition on that, where they can't make that deal. Now, keep in mind that this is a contractual obligation, like anything else in any of these documents is a contractual obligation. If you're going to be bad and you're going to default, you don't care what's written. It doesn't matter. But this is what it says and what's supposed to happen. Um, So it's a, this, is, this is a present assignment. See, it says right there, it is the intention of the parties to sign it be a present assignment. However, it is also contains provisions that say as long as there's no default, as long as the borrower is doing whatever else he's supposed to be doing under the loan documents, the borrower is entitled to keep the money and as long as they're making the payments and collect the rents. I mean, it's got to be normal. But they want it to be a present assignment so that the bank doesn't have to do anything if they need to step in. And again, as I said to you, everything is repeated. So in the mortgage, I showed you where there was a, the right to appoint a receiver. Well, here it is again. Uh, where, where foreclosure is filed, they can have a receiver come in there. They can uh, go after the property. They can do all the things that they're supposed to do. But, but because the banks only want things in their favor, it says, at the top of the next page, the lender shall not be obligated to perform uh, any of the obligations under the leases. Just give me the money. It doesn't mean we're going to fix anything. It doesn't mean we're going to do anything. So it's, it's very one-sided, but it's between the borrower and the lender, and it's for the lender's protection. Um, then it goes on to say what the, what the bank can do with the money. It's all the same things we talked about in the mortgage. Pay the taxes fix things, do whatever's necessary. They're not obligated, but they're reserving the rights to do that. Um, okay. That's the assignment of leases. So that, that is there for the operation of the property. Now, remember this is, we're talking about a construction loan. And we're talking about the various things that go on. And in, in yes? Quick question, are these uh, documents available on Canvas or no? On what? Canvas. You know what that was? Um, I'll make a deal with you. You tell me what Canvas is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I actually tried to email these a couple of days ago. Uh, and I, you, you mentioned earlier. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Is Canvas a way for me to upload them to you? Yes. 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 Oh, good. <laughs> well, honestly, listen, I'm, I'm usually pretty tech savvy. Nobody trained me on, this, on the Nova system. Yeah. So I, I don't know how to do that. I thought when I saw a group email that it was like the name of the, name of the course, the number, at groups.nova.edu, I thought that email was going to all of you because there was another place on something else where I could click email all but it bounced me out of the Nova email into my personal email, and I wasn't going to do that because I couldn't get at the documents that way. So, somebody want to show me how to use Canvas another time? I will upload everything because I bet, obviously that's better for everybody. Yeah. Happy to do that. I'm all about it. Believe it or not, as a lawyer, you might find this unusual if you've ever been in the law office, I have no paper on my desk. I, I scan everything. I read most of my documents on the screen. I edit as I'm reading a lease, a long document now. Sometimes if it's really long and my eyes are getting fuzzy, I will print it and read it down, but I'm still making changes as I'm doing it. It just gives me the ability so that if I want to work at home or if I want to work in one of our other offices, I can get it all my documents without having to worry, oh my god, I left the file on my desk. So yes, I'm all about that kind of stuff.
Just somebody train me. <laughs> What's that? No problem. No problem. So, happy to pay. It cost you one grade. No. <laughs> development uh, more so more so than when you're operating things in order to get permission from the governmental entity to build something you have to have permits you have to have a building permit that's kind of simple uh, various permits for electrical and plumbing but generally the main permits so you go to the city or the county depending upon where you are and you apply for these permits, and the contract against the permits and goes ahead with the building of the building. Well, since this is a construction loan, if something happens mid-construction and the borrower fails, and believe me, that happens in downturns all the time, the bank wants to step in and they want to be able to come in and finish the project. So this document, among other things, you see in the middle of the title is the assignment of the permits. So this is a document that says that if there is a default, that the bank is entitled to step in and take over all of the permits that were issued to the bar for the building of the property. Similarly, once the property is finished, I don't know why the permits is in the middle, but once the property is finished, you have licenses to operate the property, and you have warranties from your contractors, warranties on the equipment, you put it in a, uh, 47 ton air conditioning unit to run your motel, your hotel, you need that warranty has to run to somebody so that if there's a problem, the bank then has the right to call for the warranty service. So this loan document collaterally assigns all of these things. Uh, let's see if it was an enumeration. Of course, at any time you're, you're dealing with any of these loan documents, sorry, I want to just make sure I see them reading what I'm telling you. So the first three whereases, you're going to find in almost all of these documents that we're going to go through, these are what I call ancillary loan documents, where the note and mortgage are really primary. These are like the extras. They have extra reasons, but they're not your mainstream documents. They're all going to have these recitations. And the recitations are that the owner, who's the person signing this document, owns the property. The lender has agreed to make a loan. The loan is evidenced by the note and the mortgage, uh, pursuant to which they're going to create the project. And the last whereas is, a, as an additional condition, we want this piece of paper. So, and then remember I said, I talked about consideration? Here's the now therefore. In consideration of the sum of $10 and other good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged. Okay, nonsense. But it's old fashioned legalese. Lawyers are typically very reluctant to back off of tried and true language. So even though there are mutual promises back and forth, which would be adequate legal consideration, every contract is going to have recitations like this. So then it goes to the definitions, and it talks about the loan and the mortgage, and there are all the loan documents. All the things are being signed in the loan documents. Um, now it talks about, in paragraph two, it describes the, the additional collateral. Remember, the main collateral is the land. Then we talked about the fixtures and equipment and the machinery and all the other things that go with it. Now here's additional collateral in paragraph two. Licenses, permits, approvals, certificates, agreements, blah, 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 lots of things. Those are all the licenses. Warranties, guarantees, uh, all appliances and fixtures. So those are all the things that the bank would need to take over the project, finish the construction and operate it. So paragraph three, the bar is collateral is signing. However, paragraph four, same as the assignment of rents, they get the right to continue to use these things until there's a defense of default. Fairly simple. Uh, then they, they go on, and this is going to be common to most of these kinds of documents. And you'll see why there's a lot of, what's better? Can I see four, just for a second? Four says, until there's an event of default, the borrower can continue to do what they're doing. Okay. Okay. But then once there's a default, that's when the lender can step in and take over the borrower's rights. Same thing as proceeding with a mortgage foreclosure. It's just, this is all really going to be part of the same thing because what's going to wind up happening is that these rights that are in a document like this are only going to be exercised 
once the lender is in control of the property, which usually would mean the appointment of a receiver. Every once in a while you will find a, a cooperating borrower working with the lender and say the borrower is, uh, is, is, is an experienced builder and they're just having financial problems and the lender knows it. So the lender may say, hey, we know you're better at building this type of project than anybody else we do business with and while you're in default and we can't exercise all of our rights, we're going to hold you in default, we're going to exercise the default provisions, but we're going to leave you in possession and we want you to finish your project. That will happen sometimes because even though the, the financial atmosphere is such that it's caused a default, the person, the borrower is still the one who's in the best position to make this thing work. Well, what would be his incentive to do that? Because if they're going to still hold them in the bowl, won't they just you'll take see, it? You'll see another document in here that provides a huge amount of incentive for them to cooperate. Oh, okay. Okay? Um, so then it, various uh, various requirements that are here, what happens after the default, um, personal representations, no prior assignments, things like that. And again, for the Department of Redundancy Department, there's the waiver of trial by jury. It's going to be in every single document. I don't think they could be separate. So the point of this document is to make sure that the um, so that the lender has agreed to make the loan and that the borrower can kind of do whatever, can do whatever until there's a default? Until there's a default. And once there's a default, it gives the lender the right to take the project over, mm -hmm. step into the shoes of the borrower, mm -hmm. and let's say borrower has a contract with you as a supplier of iron, mm -hmm. steel, whatever. The lender now can go to you, and you'll see in a minute where there's, there's, you've agreed to this, where I can, as a lender, I can come to you and say, hey, you agreed with the bar to supply this steel at this price. We want you to honor your contract. We're going to pay you what you're entitled to, but we need your steel to finish the project. Okay? okay? So that gives the lender the right. That, not that particular document. That particular document is more for the building permits and the warranties. Okay? okay? So the next topic is a little out of order. Um, you have a problem with that, call Kathy, my assistant. She shuffled this one. Um, I, I, I don't want to start moving them to, into different orders. This is a closing document called the No Lean Affidavit. This is a document that you will find in one form or another in every closing. And it is a, um, it's a title document that a seller signs in a slightly different form at a closing or a borrower signs as part of the loan. And it says, I'm in possession, nobody else has a right. Um, I haven't entered into any other contracts. There's no unpaid taxes or anything. I'm of legal age, which is the affiance of legal age. I don't know why that's in here, but some people put stuff like that in there because if you're really looking to an entity, but you want to make sure that the six-year-old isn't signing the affidavit, that probably wouldn't be enforceable. Uh, there's no judgments against the property, no improvements we haven't paid for. Um, no improvements have been made. I will talk about why on the survey and when we get to title. Is the, the, uh, the title commitment is relatively accurate. I would object to that normally on behalf of a borrower because how does a borrower know what that is? Um, no matters pending that could give rise to a lien because that's important because there's a period of time between the last title search. And I will get into this in more detail when we get to title, but there's a period of time between the last possible title search and the time the documents actually get recorded called the gap that you just can't search. The information isn't available to search. So you get a statement from the owner of the property stating that these things aren't pending, that nothing's been done that could, that could interfere or get in front of the mortgage. And the 10 and 11 are together that the person signing, who's usually the owner of the company, president of the company, says, I'm not even going to go and execute. I'm not going to run before you get to the courthouse and get something else recorded ahead of you. Uh, and paragraph 12 is an interesting one where the loan is being obtained for business purposes as opposed to being used for personal and that takes it out of the realm of all kinds of regulations of uh, residential mortgages. So that's why the bank wants that in there. They were so adamant about that that they have yet another piece of paper, a business loan affidavit that says exactly the same thing. This is for business. This is, this is not for um, personal use, 
And by the way, in case you think we're kidding, the bank says, we want you to know it's a federal crime. And here the affiant, the person signing, is making a statement to the bank, acknowledging that it is a federal crime to knowingly make false statements in connection with a federally related loan. So that means you're going to big prison. You're going to loan document prison. That's even worse. <laughs> Every day you have to read this. Okay, so the next document is a Uniform Commercial Code Financing Statement form. There's not a lot of substance, there's a lot of fill in the blanks. What you need to know about this is where the mortgage deals primarily in real estate, things that are attached and affixed to the dirt, the UCC financing statement covers things that are floating and certain intangible things. Well, what kinds of things, are you, you might ask, are we talking about? So let's go to the things page. Look at all that fine print. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? So this is talking about really anything that's not attached. Um, without getting into too much unnecessary detail, UCCs are, for, are filed with the state of Florida, the Secretary of State, and it's for things that are not fixtures, not attached to the realty. Um, all kinds of things, including intangibles. Now, if it's a, if we're talking about a business loan as opposed to a um, a real estate loan, in a business loan, you're talking about accounts receivable, cash, um, inventory. And you can see all those things listed on here because everybody uses a similar kind of exhibit that covers absolutely everything you could possibly think of. But in a, in the non real estate situation. You're going to have many more of these things. Uh, we even see, like here in C, we talked about potential condemnation. So in case the mortgage didn't cover it, this is going to say once you get the money for the condemnation, it's ours, we have a lien on it as well. Uh, so, all, all, so that's what the UCC does. And then you'll see in H all kinds of different contractual rights. There are things that could just be hovering in the air. Anything related to this property that this borrower has that's related to this property, we're going to, the bank is going to take a lien on it. Then, when you get down here into, into J, until, until that, when that truck comes with the, with the rebar or the wood or the wire, until it gets put into the building, it's floating. It's building materials. It's personal property. It's not real property. So they're going to encumber that too. And if you look, you'll see a pretty, uh, pretty big list of things, but as lawyers do, it says, personal property shall include but not be limited to. And those are magic words we put in there so that in case we forget to put something in the list because you just really can't think of anything. Everything, but they try. So it deals with cash, contracts, any kind of income, accounts receivable. Um, I don't know why they would encumber the water, sanitary, and storm sewer system, but that's really part of the dirt. But everything possible because the bank wants to make sure that if you fail as a borrower and they need to take over, they get everything. They want the desks, the chairs, the computers, the pens, the pencils, the, the screens, the roll, the podium, everything. They want everything. So there's more and more and more documentation to make sure of it. And the reason that there's so many documents is that there's so many lawyers. True. There's everybody, because for every lawyer that creates these loan documents, there's three out there that try and wiggle their way around them. They're representing the borrower, and the borrower is in trouble. That's when it, you, you find the talent of people that can delay a legal action like this. The residential, the residential mortgage foreclosure said it's very easy, because what happens, unfortunately, is you have these massive foreclosure firms that hire entry-level people to do the work, because it's really just paper shuffling. And if you get in there and file any kind of a any kind of a slightly sophisticated defense, they take the file and they put it off to the side of the desk, and you can stall the things for months and months. It's a terrible thing, but you hear from people, oh, I've been in my house for four years, it's been in foreclosure, because they stalled it. Okay, anybody know what the Patriot Act is? What's that? I was being so Oh, please. I, I, I said, where we gave away all of our rights. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is after post 9 11. Yeah, post 9 11. Yes. Well, 
Okay, you could you could look at it oh, that way, or you could look at it as protecting you from the people, the others. Okay. The others. The others. The no names. <laughs> the no names. People on the other side of the island. Come on, you got some lost fans right here, right? No. Yeah. All right. So so truthfully, and all the banks want to know that you know terrorists. I mean, it says so right there. It's a terror. It's the terrorism executive order, and yes, it is absolutely after 9/11. And so they want to make sure that the people, because there's lists, block persons, specially designated nationals, most people just say, oh, you're not fine, sorry. Unfortunately, what happens with this is you can have perfectly legitimate businessmen, business person, sorry, who have ethnic names. And because they have those kinds of names, it pops up on the list. It, it's a problem with traveling, it's a problem with the OFAP orders and things like that. And, and I mean, I have one particular client, he's a very respected businessman, but he has a, a, a Middle Eastern name. And it's a, a common sounding name and it pops up all the time. It's a, you know, it's a problem. What can you do about it? Okay, next. Ah, uh, the beloved statement of attorney's face. <laughs> no, I mean, everybody, everybody wants to get paid for what they do, right? No, but what this, what this document says is really this doesn't talk about um, getting paid. What this says is that the bank is charging attorney's fees as part of the loan closing. However, they don't represent the bar, they represent the bank. Who pays it? The uh, borrower. Exactly. So in order to, because I've, I have had many situations where the days when people just decide they don't want to have a lawyer for something, not this kind of closing, but, oh, I don't need a lawyer, the bank has a lawyer. Okay? That's true. Who do you think wrote these stacks of documents? And this protects the bank and the bank's lawyer from a claim saying, well, wait a minute, you were supposed to protect me, weren't you? No. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm dealing with all these. These, these are ancillary documents, um, which I call silly documents when I'm in the right kind of a closing. This is an anti-coercion statement. What used to happen back in the early days of lending, and I can go back to the good old days, even long before my time, when you had the neighborhood banks and you weren't dealing with the Wells Fargo's and the Sun Trust and the Bank of America's and the whatever the others were going to But you had the little, like, First Bank of Davies. You go into the first bank of Davy and you talk to your friend who was your next door neighbor who was a banker. And he said, I want to buy a new house. He said, sure, come on in. And then he would say, I just have one more thing I want to ask you. In order for me to give you this loan, you, you seem to be okay. I want you to come next door. My brother in law has an insurance agency next door. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind buying your insurance from my brother in law, I'll be happy to give you the loan. And while we might not say it in so many words, certainly not today, but back then, it was implied that if he didn't go next door to, his, to the brother in law by the insurance, you didn't get the mortgage. So, in today's overly regulated world, this document is an anti coercion statement saying that the bar had free choice, that the insurance company uh, was the borrower's choice, and had nothing to do with the lender's requirements. <clears throat> Financial affidavit, really straightforward. I gave you a bunch of financial statements in order for you to qualify me for the loan. They're true. Really, it also says that as between the time I gave you the package of papers three weeks ago and today, nothing has changed. Also, that there's no lawsuits or any other <coughs> bad things pending against me. And of course, there's always the statement saying, hey, yes, I see, I know I'm swearing uh, to this under oath, and I'm familiar with the nature of it. I told you these were fun documents. Okay. Bank wants to know that the borrower didn't come in um, with, with a mortgage broker because the bank doesn't want to get the letter after the closing, but they've made a $14 billion loan that a uh, friendly neighborhood mortgage broker says, hey, I, I, did, I told the borrower to come see you, and I want 2% of the loan amount, please, is my fee. So 
So this is a certificate saying no. Oh, okay. Hazardous substances. Simple, simple looking document where it says, the bar, and this is actually much lighter than most. The affidavit regarding hazardous substances is basically a statement from the bar saying that to their knowledge, there's no contamination. That they haven't done anything to contaminate the property. That they have no notice that there's been any contamination of the property. Because what happens is the lender can get stuck. The lender takes the property back. And it has been contaminated. There could be a lien on the property based upon the contamination. The lender might get stuck with the cost of remediation, or they might have to walk away from the collateral. I actually had one situation where the lender walked away from the collateral completely because it would be cost. They didn't, they didn't want to own it. They did not want to take title to it because as the an owner in the chain of title, you can be held responsible under the environmental regulations. Now, what's a little unusual about this document I'm a little surprised here, it must be somewhere else, is that it's only a provision for the signature by the borrower. In most loans, uh, there may be another document called the dark environment, oh, sorry, it's two pages ahead, jumping. There are certain things that the bank wants um, the borrower to be personally obligated for. And again, I'm sorry, the package is a little out of order to my choosing, but, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I've run out of documents on this PDF. Maybe that's just the note. That's just the note. Okay, agreement to cooperate. This is real simple. If there's a, if somebody made a mistake, I mean, one paragraph. If somebody made a mistake, if the bank made a mistake, there's a clerical error or something like that, Borrower agrees to come back in and um, fix it. It doesn't mean they can change the terms of the loan. It just means they'll make it, they'll fix it. And you'll notice on this one, we haven't gotten to the document yet. That's why I keep picturing that it's out of order. But um, the borrower signs, and then you see three signature blocks for the guarantor. That's the human, because you want the human's the one that has to come back in and sign the document. Okay, here's an indemnity agreement for hazardous substances. And you'll see in this very first paragraph, you have the borrower up here, and then you have the indemnitor or guarantor. So what this is, is here the lender is asking not only the borrower, but the humans who are guaranteeing the loan to <coughs> personally agree that if there's an environmental problem that's going to cost money, and if the borrower doesn't have the money, the owners of the property, the owners of the borrower are going to come forward and pay to clean the property up and do whatever's necessary to protect the lender from having to have environmental obligations. And this is when they buy or even after? We're on loan documents here. As long as this loan, as long as this loan is... <coughs> Well, okay, so, so typically, you're going to get an environmental inspection before you purchase property. It's part of your normal inspections. Certainly, if you're borrowing money, the bank is going to require it as a condition of the loan closing because they want a third-party report to say that there's no environmental contamination so it's clean. But, we're talking about a hotel here. That's fairly easy. Somebody mentioned car dealership earlier. Car dealerships, although most car dealerships today uh, are in compliance for the most part. Many uh, older ones used to not be. So you're washing a car, and there's oils and such on the car, and they get down into the catch basin, and it contaminates, and it causes a problem. This could be during the life of the load, or it could be worse. They could have a tank, you know, an underground fuel tank. It could rupture. It could be an old one. Something bad could happen. So during the course of the loan, the bank needs to be protected from any kind of an obligation like that. Right, but it's tying it back to the original seller? No, we're not dealing with the seller. This is, this is a loan document. This is between borrower and bank. Seller's out on this one. Yes? So, do they ask, are they asking for them to personally or like at the business level? Both. Both. 
Och vad är mig? Absolutely. And you got we're gonna we're gonna get hopefully there's another document that's even broader. I don't know where it is, but it's in here somewhere. Yes, there are there are there are various obligations. It's not. There are various obligations that the individuals have to sign personally. So then then this would be considered a, a recourse one. Give me hold that. Hold that, I will jump into that in a minute. Uh, bless you. Uh, assignment of most people are allergic to uh, personal guarantees. <laughs> Assign <laughs> assignment of contract plans and specification is similar to the assignment of permits. Again, it gives the bank the right to come in there and uh, take over the plans to finish. And there's a huge exhibit attached to this as to what's being assigned, all kinds of things. Now, what's not here, okay, for some reason I'm missing a couple of documents that I would have liked to play with but I'm going to go over them without the benefit of the fix because some of the questions have been generated and I'm also missing a few interesting things here. Um, the personal guarantee and recourse. So the very first words we talked about when I started these fascinating loan documents on the promissory note were promise to repay? Yes. Right, exactly. It said, I promise to pay. That's how every promissory note starts. I promise to pay. But who's the I or the we? In the case of the promissory note that we're talking about here, it's XYZ LLC, the borrower, which is a limited liability company, because that's how people do business, a corporation, partnership, a limited liability company. So, if the borrower, the entity, fails to pay, the lender has the right to go and take the property back under the mortgage. The lender also has various rights under all of these documents that we've been talking about to come back in and take over the permits and take over the various things. What happens in my example of the bubble where the property is worth six million dollars and now because we've had a downturn in the economy, the property is worth $4 million and the loan is $5 million, these round numbers. Now the bank goes and they foreclose and they take the property and they resell the property to a third party where they don't get $4 million. What does the bank do with the other million dollars that they're owed? Answer, under the personal guarantee, if it's full recourse, under the, under the personal guarantee, if it's an unlimited guarantee, they can go back to the human that signed on and said and say, give me the, the extra million dollars. You agree to pay personally if the property now they can elect, they can elect an alternate remedy. They don't have to take the property. It doesn't happen very often because it's big money, but if you have a wealthy enough guarantor, and it does happen, they can go directly to the guarantor under the guarantee documents and not go after the property and say, we don't want to operate a hotel. You have plenty of money, pay us. And it, 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 that occurs. OK. That's, pers that, that's an unlimited personal guarantee. Then we have limited recourse guarantees. We talked about recourse. Recourse means the right of the bank to go against somebody, to go against the borrower. In a limited guarantee, you have a situation where the, the, between the credit and the collateral, the bank has agreed to make a loan without asking the borrower to sign for the full $14 million loan. Much relief to the borrower. However, they have what's called a bad boy guarantee. And a bad boy, and it, it's, it's a term of art, you won't see those words, but it's, it's called a limited guarantee. And what happens is it says, if the building gets knocked down and you get a chunk of insurance, if you steal the insurance money, if you run away with the security deposits, if you do other kinds of bad things, and there's a list of different kinds of bad acts that would happen, then we can come after you for the, all the money. However, if you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing and you don't do it very well and you fail and you haven't done these things and you cooperate and you don't do, well, 
that no, we're just going to look to the property. It's less likely, but again, it depends on certain types of collateral. Uh, the the long-term fixed rate permanent insurance company types of loans or big bank loans or securitized financing, you're going to have no recourse. Right. Um, but you, you're still going to have those personal guarantees. A couple of things that I, I'm sorry I don't have documents for, uh, but I do want to discuss of these assignments and, and things that are a little bit controversial are in the construction loan. So we talked about assignments of the licenses, permits, contracts, things of that nature. But you know what we didn't get here? Because there's been a simpler set of documents. So the borrower signs a piece of paper. Remember we talked about the steel going back and forth and you agree that you're going to, you're going to um, have a, 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 you're going to work with the bank. So the bank can come to you and say, hey, but how does the bank know when the borrower signs that document that the contractor is going to agree? The contractor may say, hey, I have a relationship with Joe Builder, and I've worked on many projects with him, and I, I, I don't want to deal with the bank. I don't like this bank. They're nasty people. So they're not a party to it. There's another document, there's a series of documents missing from this package. If I find them, I'll include them, someone teaches me to upload them. Um, and it's an, it's an agreement or an assent or a consent from the architect, the general contractor, uh, the engineer, any of the professionals that are involved in the construction of the project to say to the bank, we agree that if the bar defaults, and you have to step in and take over the project. We are acknowledging that the borrower has assigned these collaterally to you to give you the rights to take over the project. And we agree as the contracting party with the borrower that we will honor our contracts to you. And we acknowledge this assignment and we agree to the assignment. This is not always the easiest thing in the world to get. Um, first of all, the contractors don't like signing loan documents. That's not their business. Why, why, why should I sign that? I, I just agreed to deliver trucks of steel to you. I'm not going to sign you bank's documents. Then it gets into all kinds of things. The fight that I had a week, go ahead. With that, would the bank also retain the right to assign their position? Like say they take over the, the development and instead they want to sell it to a different developer? Yes. Okay. Banks don't usually build things. Um, here. Look at the first paragraph. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have gone through this. You'll find this all over the place. See the last line in the first paragraph? We're signing, we're signing all the things to lender, which term as used here in shall in every instance include the lenders, successors, and assigns. Okay. So the lender is because, remember I mentioned that some lenders just originate loans? Mm -hmm. Things happen during the course of banking where lender A, banks take over other banks all the time. So the lender has all these documents in the middle of the construction loan. They may sell the whole bank to another bank and we have all the assets of the other bank and more likely it's the assets of the bank than the bank itself. Eh, maybe not so much. In a, in a commercial business, yes, banking not so much. But so now all of a sudden, when you've made a deal with uh, Centennial Bank to do this, the guy knocking on your doors from Bank of the Ozarks, and you may say, who are you? Well, I have all this paper that you signed. All right, well, you're stuck. You, and the borrower doesn't have anything to say about that. Because the lender is going to have complete rights to assign, and when they can assign, they assign everything. It's, 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 a, it's a whole. Do they, do they spell out like conditions or is it or is that just enough? That's enough. That's enough? That's enough. The, 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 no, the, conditions, the conditions are between the assignor and the assignee, the two banks. But in terms of the borrower, no. Whatever, this document, this document is valid in whoever's hands it's in. That's enough to say that, that you can assign it? Yes. Oh, is the, the, there, there are certain lenders' positions are always freely assignable. 
Now, if there's something special about the lender, if you have a particular relationship or something, and you have the negotiating strength, which is less usual, then yes, you can do something to restrict it. But that would be unusual, because you want the money. If you want the money, you sign the papers. But that's what it really boils down to. So th this last week's torture involved the assignment of leasing commissions and, le and the exclusive right to lease, not the commission so much. So the client is refinancing an apartment building, which has a retail component and maybe a, a commercial component where a storage, if they get the right parking waivers. There is a, a, a listing agreement with a national real estate brokerage company that the brokerage company is going to lease up the units and do all kinds of things. Well, as part of the loan documents, just like this assignment of contracts and plans and specifications, along comes the loan document from the, the lender that says that the borrower assigns to the lender uh, this agreement. Sounds fairly straightforward, except that it went on to say that if there's a default by the borrower, that the real estate broker waives the right to take any payments for any of its commissions during the time period of default, until the default is cured or the lender allows the money to be dispersed. Guess what? The real estate brokerage company, big national company, lawyers, agent, you know, well respected, said, wait a minute, we're not signing that. We, we, you know, this is our money that we've earned. Um, we agree that we won't take a prepayment. We'll, we agree that we will work with you, the bank, if something happens. We're not waiving our rights. We're not letting you hold our money because your borrower is in default. Right. So this became a controversy back and forth. And it got to the point where the, the, lender, the lender was being inflexible. Now, this was not your typical institutional lender that you would encounter like a bank on the corner. This was a couple of lenders, two lenders out of New York. Um, New York lawyers were probably one of the largest law firms in the world. And he was being very ornery. And this, it, they kept pushing back on this. It became a post-closing agreement. Post-closing agreement happens when you're, I mean, these documents are usually fiercely negotiated between the borrower's counsel and the lender's counsel. And they don't always get done in time for closing because it just happens. So sometimes they will allow a minor document to be taken care of after closing, and this particular one was. So now it got put back into my lap a month after the closing to negotiate this document. Well, now we have the money. So the bargaining position is a little bit better because now we're in a situation where we're not, we're not giving in to everything that the lender is asking for because you want to get the loan closed. Still, it's still a loan requirement to comply. The, lend, the, the, the real estate company said, we are not going to do what the bank is asking. And if they insist on not making these changes to the document, we are going to reconsider our relationship with the property as the exclusive leasing agent. Now, this is, again, Good, good company, well respected in the market. The borrower needs them to lease up the property. We then wrote to the lender. I cut, literally cut and pasted that statement from the broker's email to the lender and said, "You are jeopardizing the project by this requirement. You know, this is unreasonable. This is not collateral. This is has nothing to do with this. You have no right to do this to the lender. Good, fix it." A day later, I got an email back from the lawyer saying the client has waived the document. It is no longer a post-closing requirement. Second time it happened during the course of the events where rather than be reasonable, they just gave up. It happens, unfortunately. So these kinds of, it really becomes a tri-party agreement where you have the, the borrower and lender who have the business with a contractual business relationship and now you have third parties. Again, it's the, the example I gave is, is the real estate broker who's leasing up the property, essential to the project. But it's the same thing when you deal with the general contractor or the engineer or the architect. 
And if the lender puts something ridiculous in these assignments that says that they agree to not do this or not do that, it's a problem. And then they're not going to do it. Um, other documents that we don't have that would be in loan documents would be an opinion letter from the borrower. This is something that is required by every loan where the lender's lawyer is looking to the borrower's lawyer to give a letter saying that the borrower is in good standing, they have the authority to move to, to do this, we've examined their documents, even though we've given everything to the lender and the lender's lawyer, they want the borrower's lawyer to make all these statements that the, that the people are, have the authority to do it, they're not bankruptcy, various things like that. And there's a little bit of back and forth uh, between as to what, what we're willing to, we as lawyers are willing to put in a letter for the lender to rely on because quite honestly they've done their own due diligence and we're certainly not, we are not the guarantors of the loan. Ah. There's another document kind of related to the Patriot Act document called the Certificate of Beneficial Ownership. With entities, whether it's recourse or non-recourse, more likely in a recourse loan, the bank wants to know who the owners are. And typically, a, you know, you could, have, you could have multiple entities and multiple owners. Um, certificate of Beneficial Ownership. In English, who owns this project? <laughs> really, they want to know whether, whether evaluating who needs to be a guarantor, whether it's on the personal guarantee, the bad boy guarantee, the environmental indemnity or anything else that's personal, they're usually looking for ownership, anybody that's got 20% or more of the beneficial ownership in the company. And if you see how ownership is structured in some of these things, it's not so easy to find out. So because you're going to have borrowers XYZ LLC, and that's got three that's LLCs that are the members, and each of those LLCs have different LLCs that are the members, and it's like tentacles of an octopus. Right. But they want to know who owns, who's the real owner. Because it's important for the guarantee purposes, and it's important for the Patriot Act stuff. And enough? Mortgage do loan documents? Yeah. Any, any more questions on the loan documents, or the mortgage process, or the closing, or the construction loan, or any of that kind of stuff? No? Okay. Take a breath, I want to move on to something completely unrelated back to the topic of paying for the property. And I'm going to try not to get into too much tax detail on this, but what I want to talk about is called a tax deferred exchange. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Aaron? Did Aaron come back? OK. Just checking. Did you get any of Alex I did. Somebody said you were here. I not believe them. That's why we said Alex is here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm just mix, mix the, um. No, just I was only there's two two people missing. One who was missing the last time, and I think probably dropped, and the other was Aaron, who was missing the last time. Just have to report. I don't want to control. Okay. Tax deferred exchange. You buy a piece of property. Grandpa bought a piece of property. It's even better. Grandpa bought a piece of property. And it's been in the family for 30 years. Grandpa paid $5,000 for the property way back when. It's now worth $500,000. And you have an opportunity to sell it to Joe Developer. You have a tax basis. The Grandpa has a tax basis in the property. I'm not going to say you because we don't want to get into the estate tax stuff. but. Grandpa has an opportunity now to sell it for $500,000, which means he has a $495,000 tax gain subject to taxes. He likes real estate, and he knows that if he sells it and pays his taxes and puts the money in the bank, he's going to get a 2% yield on his cash after he loses 22% of his gain money to the, to the capital gains. And that just doesn't sound appealing. What do you do? Under Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, there's a, something called a tax deferred exchange. Basically, it is a provision that allows you to take an investment in real estate 
and continue the investment in real estate by exchanging it for another piece of real estate. The original, simple, basic way this started was I have a property that you like and you have a property that I like and let's just exchange deeds and no money. That almost never happens. I mean, very, very, very rare that it would happen. But in that situation, if you think about it, each party is continuing their investment. Yes, the property that they're giving up has a much higher value than what they paid for it, but they're not getting any money in their hand, so they really don't have any cash to pay taxes, and it would be fair for them not to have to pay taxes in that situation. Not that there's any fairness in the Internal Revenue Code, but this is, this is a provision that says that if you engage in this transaction, you can defer. This is a very important word when it comes to tax deferred exchanges. Defer is not avoid. It doesn't mean, well, no, there's nothing, by the way, there's nothing wrong with tax avoidance. Tax evasion is a bad thing. But you are, there is a huge difference. You are allowed to structure your business affairs to minimize your income tax. Absolutely. There's a lot of planning, and this is one of the ways. Sir? So you, when you say avoidance, you can carry it forward? That's deferring. Defer. Carrying it forward, not avoid. Forget it. Okay, so, yeah, so when you're Defer. deferring it forward, and then... Let me, let, me, let me continue, and I'll, I'll give do. you a, a good explanation. Yeah. So what happens is... You reach, I'm going to go through the mechanics of the tax deferred exchange, and then I'm going to go through the consequences and what happens with how the deferral works and what the effect is on replacement property. So the first thing, obviously, is you get somebody that comes along and wants to buy your property. You enter into a normal contract for sale, and you get through your diligence, and you get down towards near the closing, and you realize that this.